Our mission is to support families affected by Edwards syndrome, trisomy 18, while changing the medical perspective through efforts of advocacy, education, and public policy. So LEAP, our literacy education and advocacy program is an educational resource program promoting health literacy, community education, and patient advocacy. So promoting health literacy enhances an individual's capacity to obtain, communicate, understand health information in order to make informed health decisions. We want to make sure that patients and their advocates, their families are able to make informed decisions. Um, promoting community education enhances peer-to-peer -peer interactions, knowledge, development skills, and assists with access to community service and support, such as early intervention programs and special education, and learning to navigate um, the special education as, as your child ages. Uh, the patient advocacy component promotes effective communication between patients and healthcare providers. Advocacy is basically knowing your healthcare goals, communicating the goals to the providers, and asserting your rights as a patient or a caregiver. Zebra is our comfort care program. So Zebra, Zebra um, is designed to support uh, end of life solutions for families living with Edwards syndrome. The comfort care focuses on physical comfort, daily care, physical support, and emotional support for both the patients and the caregivers. Through Zebra, the EWI Foundation um, offers resources, intervention, counseling, and bereavement support. STRIPE is our financial assistance program. So STRIPE is an economic assistance program that's designed to help um, ease the financial burden that can be associated with medical complexities and specialized medical care. So families facing economic hardship due to Edwards syndrome can submit an assistance request form via our website. Um, families with medically complex um, children experience financial hardship uh, via loss of income, missed work, travel expenses, often due to where they are um, relative to where their child's being treated, um, and just unexpected medical expenses or special needs related expenses, um, which once you bring your child home can be, can be many. The financial assistance form can be found at the ewefoundation.org backslash stripe or on our stripe page on our foundation website. So Camp Ewe, which is coming soon, Camp Ewe will provide a fun and uh, fun and relaxation for both children and their families that are affected by Edwards syndrome and other rare diseases. So Camp Ewe is designed for individuals with medical complexities and designed to support those individuals while they're at camp. Camp Ewe is a place of belonging in a medically inclusive environment. Families will attend free of charge. It's a sponsored program. Uh, for more information, or if you're interested in supporting this program, please contact us. We'd love to have you be involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you'd like to look at our website, uh, the address is www.theewefoundation.org. Uh, again, if you have questions uh, and we don't get to answer them during the presentation, we'll follow up with an email. Our next speaker is uh, Pavithi Krishnan, and she is the Foundation Alliance Manager for Global Genes. She started, um, she earned her M uh, Master of Science from Rutgers University in New Jersey and her clinical training from Mayo Clinic Health Services, Health Sciences, excuse me, in Rochester, Minnesota. She has worked as a clinical dietitian at Duke University Medical Center and has gained experience in the non profit world from her role as a patient engagement advocate in North Carolina. Parvati is a speaker, panelist, and often serves on national and international efforts to promote patient and caregiver experience. As a mom of two medically complex children, Parvati is passionate in helping others find their voice and message. She loves sunshine, gardening, and traveling. Parvati, would you like to take it from here? I sure will. So is it okay if I share my screen right now? Good morning to all of you. Please give me a thumbs up or something if you can see my screen. Does that work? Okay. Yes, we can see it. 
Perfect. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I am so glad um, to have been invited to share a little bit about myself and our journey into advocacy and into just whatever we do, living the rare life. Uh, so part of my um, presentation is going to be what I see as advocacy and what I see as um, sharing my story and what we've done with our, the life that we um, have been living. So I'll just dive right in. Um, and I like to put in here what what really is a definition of an advocate, because, you know, I, I have been working in the space now living through the, this life. But when I figured it was I was like, OK, everybody talks about advocacy and advocate and capacity building. And, you know, I was like, what does this all mean? Like, what does it mean to be an advocate? How can I call myself an advocate? And so I took the actual definition of an advocate and then I said, oh, one who pleads the cause to another specifically. I was like, oh, that's what we do every single day of our life when we are caregivers or patients ourselves. Um, one who supports or promotes the interest or cause for a group, well, guess what? You're advocating for your foundation. Um, and lastly, support or argue for a cause in favor of pretty much everybody, every single person here or in your community does this, and I'll show you how we've been doing it, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview and through my presentation of me sharing my story and my life with all of you, I hope that you can see um, subtly the different ways we've tried to advocate for ourselves in these particular, you know, buckets, as I like to call them, because it's, you know, one of the frequently asked questions that I get, or I don't know if anybody else has done, is this, how can we do this living our life? Because, you know, it's complicated enough just to live a normal life, and then you have a rare life, and it's like, now you're telling me I also have to advocate. So hopefully through my story, you will see what we're doing, and maybe get some pointers of what you're doing, or, or, or you can teach me what you do in advocacy. Um, so this is a little bit about our story, and I say our story because I am the representative for the family. I, I call myself a medical mom, but these are my two children, Yash and Ira, and uh, we had no idea what rare disease was until they came into our life. So this, become, this became our story. Um, you know, I, if, you, if you can go far enough and remember, um, at least as we were, you know, young and not so smart, we had this entire roadmap. We were like, we are going to become parents. We know exactly how our children's lives are going to look. We have everything planned, which school, which college, like at their wedding, like we had it all planned. It looked like this picture perfect highway. We were like, this is, this is going to be our journey to parenthood. And then we got the story that, you know, we got told we have a rare disease. And we're like, okay, what does that mean? Well, it felt like a car, a car crash. And then um, as, as I tell you more about our story, you'll see we've now been having many car crashes since that first time we were got told between both our children, we were like, oh, so pretty much when I walk into the hospital, I now say, yes, the train wreck family is here because that's how it feels and that's who we are, but we own it. And we're like, yes, we're a wreck, but you know what? It's our wreck and we are owning it. We wear our seat belts when we can and we do the best we can, but beware this is our life and this is this is just what it is so no complaints to us you know whatever is going on you have to figure that out and that's literally i'm sure what our nickname is within the hospital system because we walk in like that um to give you a little bit of of our background of how we we live our life uh my son was born in 2008 uh i think he was three years old at the very left most picture just you know neurotypical living life following that beautiful scenic pathway and then um our diagnostic odyssey started when he was about four years old when he started having blood in his tools so you see him there super thrilled that you know he's getting an x-ray and missing school and he, we had this whole day planned because we were so stressed our child was getting an x-ray and you know we did all of these things and then of course fast forward to uh 2012, I believe, when he's there, the bottom left picture is him post-surgery after about 10 hours, they took out his colon and rectum. And when he wake, woke up from anesthesia, he wanted to meet the chief resident and ask her to show him pictures of his colon. 
that they took out to make sure they took out the right organs from his body. So came a long way from that kid in the park to like, are you sure you took the right things out? But that was just him. And I was like, are you like, what's it? Are you hurting? He goes, no, I just want to see what they took out to make sure they took out the right thing. I, you know, that's just what it became. And then um, fast forward to last year, those collage of pictures that you see on the left, you know, what we used to take for granted, our child was walking and playing, um, is now a learning journey. Every time he has a massive surgery, this was after a 12 hour surgery and three weeks in the ICU, we literally had to teach our child to get up and walk. And it took a series of pictures over a week for us to make that happen. But you know, life as we knew, it just kept having many turns and many U-turns and we've just learned a completely different path that doesn't exist and that we've created for ourselves. But this is just to show that, you know, we were super scared about the first x-ray and now we're like, oh, I'm just going to take pictures while you learn to stand up and walk. And this is, this is the confidence that living this life brought to us because we knew that no matter what train wreck we walk into or what surgery we have, we have to stand back up and we have to do what we have to do um, to keep moving forward because there really is no other option. And so this is this is the story of my easier child. Um, next is the story. Of, so yes, here's my small reminder of being an advocate as a caregiver and a patient. He advocates as a patient more than we do for him. Now he's 13. He has a lot more questions to the doctor. Usually we're like, yes, we'll sign another consent. But, you know, he's like, hold on. I have questions. So it's his journey as much as it is our journey now. Um, but but that is that is what advocacy looks like as you as your child grows from doing all of this to now saying, well, you know, I really have questions, too. Um, so I wanted to include that there. This is my other uh, pumpkin. Uh, this is Ira, my daughter. Um, Yash was four when his diagnostic odyssey started. Um, he had his first colonoscopy when he was six years old, and that's around the time my daughter was born as well. Well, she chose to have her own path. She was born with six toes and six fingers, and we just thought, well, like, this is awesome. We have extra to love, because until then, we had no idea what it meant. Uh, yeah, this is how naive we were. We're like, this is great. This is perfect. Nothing's wrong. Um, well, she was not neurotypical like our child, you know, and I, now I even question what typical is because she had her own path and she had her own trajectory of what normal was. Um, but there she was, I think she was about six months old there getting physical therapy because she just, we don't know why she was exclusively breastfed and she still gained a ton of weight. And so we were like, oh, she's so squishy. There's just so much to love. Well, about a month after her physical therapy here in this picture, we were told she has a genetic condition called Bartet Beetle syndrome. Another train wreck. We're like, what on earth does that mean? No one in our family has that. We've never heard of this condition. Um, and I tell you this because our geneticist said there's no cure, uh, but they'll be developmentally delayed. Um, they'll have kidney failure issues, may need a transplant, they'll be morbidly obese. And um, they'll have progressive blindness and most kids by the time they're 10 or 11 will have night blindness and then become blind, like legally blind. We're like, oh, that's all? That's all? Like, oh my God, we now have a six month old child that you're telling us is going to go blind. You don't have a trajectory of this is when she's going to go blind, but we'll just take her home and care for her. Um, or at least that's how it felt when we told, of course, like many of you, I'm sure, or maybe not, but we were crazy. We went on Dr. Google and we were like, oh my God, what is this condition? We have to learn everything about this. Like, how can we take care of a child who's going to go blind? Um, and we found out through research that uh, there's a, a clinic in the middle of Marshfield, Wisconsin, that's a center for excellence for this condition. And then uh, we started this whole journey of we're going to go there, we're going to find out what to do and, you know, meet the uh, meet others. And I'll tell you, that was very impactful to us because we felt very isolated until then. And then uh, a year after we did that, when Ira was about to, we organized one of the family conferences. This was, this seems like a lifetime ago because we met people in person. Um, but it was like, oh, there are researchers, but we got to see adults with this condition. 
who were blind, but they were like, yeah, it never bothers us. Like we just live our life now. We, we got to meet others. And that really changed our perspective on the importance of having that community of people who get it. And so we were like, okay, now at least it, it sucks, but at least we have others who get what we're saying. Um, well, that was just one easy part of her journey. Um, on her first birthday, through all of these pictures, you know, I can speak for two hours on just our daughter's high points, but uh, some of the pictures that we captured here on her first birthday, um, she was transported in an ambulance from one local hospital to another, and um, she had a massive infection that just did not get better. But through that, she also developed an autoimmune condition called Opsoclonus myclonus um, syndrome. Um, so, you know, she did make tremendous great gains, even though she was developmentally delayed, she lost all of that because it affected her entire like near CNS system. So she um, stopped walking, cruising, babbling, um, smiling, and losing a lot of her milestones that she had made gains. But again, we, we did what we had to do, and we said, you know, we're still going to teach her to walk and do whatever we can. So that's her using her walker. Then she became wheelchair bound. Um, she received a lot of treatments. Um, and around the same time, after my son had a surgery, they felt like um, even though he had had whole genome sequencing and both of them had had whole genome sequencing, they didn't find what was, was the reason that my son was getting all these cancers. Um, and then we were just at the right place at the right time because the doctors ordered another test and they found out that they both had a condition called um, CMMRD. It's a cancer predisposition syndrome. Um, we found out that our children were the only two in the world um, thus far that we know of with homozygous FCAM mutation. Basically, beyond the mumbo jumbo, what this means is they have a genetic disorder that does not recognize abnormal cells in their body. So they will get repeated cancers throughout their lifetime. There's no cure to actually fix the genetic condition. So they try their best to um, do a lot of testing and um, surveillance so that they catch the cancer early. Um, so our daughter had her first colonoscopy when she was two and a half and they took out three cancerous polyps from her colon. Um, and so we learned one more time. It's like, how do you make a two and a half year old drink all of that? If you've ever had it, it's nasty and it's giant amounts of Miralax or colon prep. Uh, and so we had to get her an NG tube and all of that. So as, as uh, you know, like I said, I can go for hours talking about the journey that my, my children had gone through, but I'm sure so would all of you because our journeys are all unique, but some of our pain points and some of the things we experience are similar. And so... This was her through the age that she went from being just receiving PTOT and speech to receiving nursing care at home because she was completely dependent on us. So that's her nurse there. Um, and she on her wheelchair. Um, hospital was our second home. Um, her nurses and her physicians were all her preschool teachers. And that's how we lived life. Um, this is our life as a medically complex family. Um, I took both kids to doctor's appointments. Sometimes it was same floor, different floors. Um, this was this was a time when my daughters, they both were in the same hospital, different hospitals. Um, we did what we could. Uh, I would still say it's a blessing because my husband and I were able to single parent our kids individually because there were times I took my child to Boston Children's Hospital. So we live in North Carolina. In case we didn't mention, so we from North Carolina, I took my son to Boston Children's Hospital. My husband took our daughter to Cincinnati Children's and we did that multiple times. Um, but this is what we did uh, because we had to go, we had to go to give them the care that we had to give. Um, and this is what our life looked like. And I, 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 I always put this picture because a lot of times, um, physicians, researchers, industry, and sometimes other newer rare disease families don't see the, the, the gamut of, of challenges that we have. We go where we have to go to get our children the care they need. And, you know, sometimes it's simple. It's like multiple clinics in one place. Sometimes it's like this, you know, that story that I told you where we found through Google that Marshfield, Wisconsin had that BBS center. That's the position that started it. And he's just doing it because he's very committed to this condition. And, and so that we went there, Chapel Hill is home. That's why you see all the doctors are posing there with my daughter. Um, 
Cincinnati, Ohio, we went because they were the Center for Excellence for Aerodigestive Conditions. And that's one of the things our daughter had. Um, Charlotte Living Children's, one of our oncologists moved from Chapel Hill, where we used to go, to Living Children's. And much like many other rare disease families, we went where the doctor went because you know it was just much more harder to find a doctor who was committed like him in this condition to do whatever they could for our child. So I would drive her about two and a half hours one way, twice a week from where we lived to Living Children's just for her to get the special procedure. They're the only pediatric hemodialysis unit where we live. So we went there for that. Um, the very right-hand corner, uh, the reason I put that picture and I know it looks funky, um, but it's very important for rare disease families to know that sometimes you don't need to go wherever they're doing the research. You don't need to actually be a patient there, but you can still support and advocate for moving research, for supporting the researchers who work in this field. And we did that by sending blood and tissue samples to our doctors. So the largest, um, research center for our child's, uh, for Yash's and Ira's condition is through Sick Kids Toronto. There's only about 300 people in the world fully diagnosed with this condition out of which maybe about 100 or 200 are still alive. And if we break that down somewhat, our ch children are the only children in the world with a particular gene mutation. And so when we ask them, we're like, can we just come to Toronto? We went to Marshfield, we went here, we went there, we'll just come to Toronto. And they basically said, there's nothing we can do right now for your children. It's all in labs, it's all in test tubes, it's all in, you know, if you really wanna help, send us your tissue samples, send us your blood samples. So we could not find um, hospital systems that would send it. So I was like, fine, send me the test tubes. I will work, I will find the FedEx to send a bio sample from North Carolina to Toronto with a tracking number. So it had to be like, but it's possible. And this was this happened because we were very passionate and we really wanted this to go there because we felt like no matter what, our children should at least at the minimum be contributing to what these researchers are trying to do. And we're very cognizant that there may never be a cure in our lifetime or in their lifetime but at least their blood, their tissues will provide that clue that the physicians and the researchers need to continue to help so that this is not experienced by other families. Um, and so I know it's a very funky picture, but that, that was literally when I was standing in the FedEx office and I was like, I'm gonna take that picture because this is just not normal. Who sends blood you know, vials from one country to another? Um, the reason I put Phuket Thailand is because my son loves traveling and with our daughter, it's very difficult to travel because she had an autoimmune condition and we couldn't travel. So for his 10th birthday, we said, I make it super special. We're gonna take you to Thailand and it's gonna be phenomenal. Well, we landed in Thailand and he had a fever. Okay, it's okay. We went to the local hospital. They did, he has central line. They did the blood samples. On his 10th birthday at 7 a.m. in the morning, we got a call that said he has a nasty bloodstream infection and that if we don't bring him in, he will die. And so the rest of the 10th birthday celebrations were in a 200 square foot room. It's very small. Um, the three of us spent about three weeks there in a foreign country, not knowing the language, not knowing the healthcare system, just hoping and praying that we bring them back home uh, safe and sound. And they were great. And they did an amazing job. And we can, we're here now to tell the story, but the highlight for me is that nothing's ever normal for us. Even what we think is great and what we, so the best laid plans are always going to have something else happens. So for next time, we're always going to map out any place we ever have the fortune to visit to the closest hospital. And before we even do that, we are like, okay, will this hospital be able to take care of us? Do they understand the language? What kind of money do we need to keep them alive in a hospital in a foreign country with foreign currency? So uh, one of the reasons I'm sh sharing this, not that you all have not experienced this, is because in the midst of everything else we do, we are still trying our best to stay afloat. We're still trying our best to communicate, whether it was in Thailand where it was language we didn't understand or back home here where we do understand. Sometimes it feels like we're continuing these conversations that we're not sure if the physicians are listening, the researchers are listening, the industry is listening. Sometimes it feels like, hey, I'm trying to tell you something. I know you're listening, but are you really, really listening and understanding what I'm saying? So, you know, it's complex no matter what it is, but what I found is 
continuing to advocate, continuing to not give up, continuing to not um, change yourself, but try to change their mindset will eventually work. It's exhausting and sometimes frustrating, but we have to do it because our children matter or our adult care, you know, whoever we're caring for matter. And, um, you know, our hope is to keep our children alive longer than we are so that as they grow older, they can advocate for themselves. But we may even have to take care of our parents who may have a rare disease as an adult. And so no matter where you are in the spectrum, um, advocate, share your story and, and make it meaningful and make it powerful. It is frustrating and exhausting, but in the end, it will it will make a difference. And so hopefully you see that. Um, this is important to us. It's, a, it's, it's another important part of our journey. Um, just through her life, um, but when she was three and a half years old, everything we were trying was not working um, for my daughter's um, medical journey. So we did palliative care. We moved her to palliative care and hospice. Um, our goal was for her to celebrate her fourth birthday because we wanted to be there as a family and not have a hospital birthday. All other of her birthdays were in the hospital. She did make it to her fourth birthday. The picture on the left is a picture of that. Two weeks after her fourth birthday, she passed away. And um, that's when we learned that it does not matter how long you live, how well you live, um, or if you don't speak at all, because she did not in the end speak other than mom and maybe dad at one point of her life, she never spoke, but she profoundly had an impact by just being herself, by just being this unique child who knew which knew to communicate which music she wanted on her iPad by throwing her iPad at her nurses. She, she thought all her nurses, all the Bollywood songs that she liked, um, she mattered by giving her tissue samples and blood samples and, and, and giving back to research, she's always going to have her legacy. But we also felt like, what can we do um, to, to, to showcase to the world that she continues to live with us? So this is what we did, you know, when we started this and through the four years that she was with us and now seven years of this journey with our son, we realized there's, we're Indian. If you haven't figured that out by now, we're from South Asia originally, but we realized there's not a lot of people like us who, um, at that time, we're, we're on a stage or we're, we're discussing their journey or we're talking about mental health or we're talking about the difficulties of parenting medically complex children. So we wanted to um, teach our South Asian community that this is real, this does exist. People like us are in the hospital for prolonged amounts of time. And so we used Diwali, which is one of our big holidays it comes around ramadan the year we started diwali and ramadan were at the same time so we said okay we're going to do a toy drive and um, involve the community and we're going to share our story so we've done that five years in a row and it's really grown and so this was from this past year where we ended up doing um, wheelchairs and, and and all of that to give back to the local hospital because you know what we're only one part of the story there our hospitals are 24 seven, our children need care 24 seven clinics and um, child life specialists, they're all working there 24 seven. So we felt like it was our, one of our callings was to give back to UNC Children's because that's where I received most of her care. Um, we also did a Band-Aid drug because we learned that the nurses were paying for colorful Band-Aids in the hospitals. It's, it's a state hospital. So of course they're, they're going to find the cheapest Band-Aids but nurses wanted to give cute Band-Aids. And we realized we're like, I I'm sure every family can donate a box of Band-Aids. And when we all put it together, I think we had collected about 40,000 individual Band-Aids. And so it was like, the hospital said, please do not give us Band-Aids anymore because we don't have space to store it, which was a great problem because we don't want nurses spending their own personal money to buy Band-Aids, you know? So that one box of Band-Aid had such an impact in the community that we could fill an entire children's hospital all across with Band-Aids. And so I just feel like that's such a small thing to do, but collectively just showed the power of community coming together. Um, we do Ronald McDonald House meals and then like I said, we are only one in the world. We are doing everything we can with our researchers to support research. But in the meanwhile, my, my philosophy is, yes, I'll support our researchers and I'll do everything that they want us to do. But in the meanwhile, as a rare disease community, I can give back a lot more to the community itself um, because 
yes, I would love for them to find a pipeline drug that will fix my son's genetic condition. Until that happens, I can still use our experiences. So when COVID happened, you know, and I'm sure all across the country, uh, caregivers were not automatically approved to be in group one. Now everybody can walk into our grocery store and get a COVID vaccine, but at that time it wasn't. So um, we did a lot of uh, advocating in the state of North Carolina, and we did get DHHS to um, include unpaid healthcare workers, aka parents or adult caregivers, to receive the vaccine in group one. Because what we told them was, we walk into the hospital, we don't want to. We don't have a choice. Some of these procedures, some of these tests, some of our physical visits are in a hospital clinic, even though everybody else is virtual. So um, sharing our story, reaching out to others in the community, trying to do what we can will always make a difference. Um, was an advocate after reading all of this, I say you're an advocate, everyone's an advocate. If you're in this space, you're an advocate, whether you know it or not. Um, who do we advocate to? I feel like everyone, literally everyone, your family, your community, hospital, insurance, when you're fighting with your insurance, when they're not covering something, don't step back, keep pushing. You're an advocate. You know, if you're doing local things like a park or like we did for the hospital, you're advocating, you know, yes, it's a band-aid drive. It's all about band-aids, but guess what? What the goal was that if we collectively come together as a community, we can really make a difference. Um, state level, you, I'm glad everything is virtual now because it's easy to give these examples. Everybody can do it when you go, go to rare across America and you're talking to your legislator or two secretaries of his or you know interns, you're still advocating. At some point, you are still bringing across that message on a national level. I know the EWE Foundation is a part of Global Genes. That also means you're also taking your story international. So when you share as a group, as a patient, your story at different places, you're really not just advocating for yourself or your child or for whoever it is that you care for, but for the community at large. So just know that there's power in everything that you do. Um, why advocate? Well, for me, it was easy because I advocate for both of these kids, you know, as parents, not only do we, it's not like the flu that just goes away. This is forever. Um, I always say that it's not PTSD, it's CTSD, it's chronic trauma. It's, you know, as caregivers, it's like it never ends, but the beauty is it never ends. So we can fight for them, you know, whether they're with us here or they're not, in my case, with our daughter, we will continue to fight for her and with her in her in our memories and so find your purpose I know you all have it already <laughs> find find the reasons and find how you can make share your story such that they will hear if you've done it four times and they've not heard it then we think what can I change what can I tweak in my story now that I will get their attention because they are as important to our story as we are when we share it with them it. So these are the different ways I chose from just being that mom uh, to, you know, one of the ways I started advocating is when my child was in the hospital, we were there for almost four months um, after his colon was taken out. He's got a lot of complications. And at one point I noticed that the same things kept happening. The same mistakes kept happening. And I didn't want to be that whistleblower. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to have that eye roll like, oh, it's that mom or that family. And so I said, okay, I have a solution. I don't want to, don't want this to happen again. So I sat and I had all these, you know, I was like writing it all down. And I was like, fine, I have a solution to this. It may or may not work, but where do I go to do this? And I said, I don't want to go to patient, whatever that's called, where, you know, it's a complaint box. I said, I want to do that. I want to be able to have a seat at the table to tell the people who are involved. And it wasn't like EVS or food service. It was like physicians were doing something that I felt like was happening over and over again. And I, I was like, okay, maybe you guys don't know what it is for a family to be when you're doing this. So let me share that. And this is what we do. And I made some of the best physician friends when I did that. Because I said, what, how can I be more involved? And they said, well, do you, did you know we have a patient family advisory board? Like we really use them to come back with feedback. 
And so about six years ago, I was like, fine, I will join that board. I will sit in these meetings. I want to know what they're doing so that we can make a difference. And I, uh, you know, six years ago, I joined the board and I, I would go to every meeting and I would just quietly understand what they're doing. And I would say, okay, this is what I suggest. Um, six years later, I'm the chair of the patient family advisory board now. And, and you know, it, it, I have the time now. I didn't then, but it takes time. And now we do resident training. We do medical student training. We, you know, and yes, it's not for my son's condition, but it's for patients in the hospital. And a lot of those patients are rare disease patients or medically complex patients. And hopefully that will make a difference um, to them. We've spoken to industry. I speak to um, whoever will ask me to speak to because I feel like hopefully something will be heard from what I'm saying and that will spark your journey to go in a different direction or start your journey. But I speak, I speak a lot with industry about what it is like to live with, as a rare disease family because a lot of times they need to they need to understand our journey. They need to understand why we're doing what we're doing, what our pain points are. They all have good intentions. You know, yes, they have to make money in the end as well, but it would help if they're creating this drug or they're creating this clinical trial based on what we need and not based on what they think they need. So I do talk to industry because I want them to know we're all here. I, I always tell them, I'm like, all you have to do is ask. I can guarantee you, I can give you 10 advocates or organizations at the top of my hand, head who will come and talk to you. You just have to ask and you just have to find the, the, the disease specific group or the organized organization that will work with you. And if you can't find it, we will. Um, I used the FDA open comment period this year to share my thoughts on what it is to live with rare and what, uh, what our dream would be is to have more priority vouchers for rare diseases, because that means that if a company or a researcher actually came up with the drug, the FDA will still have to take its own sweet time. So having that fast priority voucher will make it more lucrative for industry and researchers to create a faster pathway to drugs. So that was um, one of the things I did. Um, and seven years later, after a lot of talk, our researchers in SickKids Toronto, where I set those blood tubes to, um, have created a research advisory board. And the research advisory board is run by parents and caregivers. So that screenshot there is the consortium where now we meet every month and we, they ask us, they say, we're working on this research protocol. What do you think? We're going to conduct this research. How do you think, what can we do for patients and families to be a part of this research? It takes time, um, but don't stop no matter where you are in this journey to advocate because in the end, whatever it is that you want will happen if we do it methodically and we do it consistently and we do it with purpose. And your purpose is always going to be, you know, whoever you're caring for. So as long as you keep that in mind and you understand that everybody wants to help, they just don't know how. And so if you have a plan of telling them how, they can't come back with, well, well, now we don't know what to do. Well, I just gave you the solution. So let's all get together and figure out what we can do. And that usually always works. Um, like I said, every single stake stakeholder in the rare disease space needs advocacy. And that is, that is why we all are advocates. Um, this is what I usually end my presentations with, and this is for everyone, no matter who I present to, including parents because I, or, or uh, caregivers. And I, I hope this is just for my children, but this is a program called Beats of Courage. And if you haven't heard of it, I hope you go find it in your hospital because it's very impactful for me sometimes. Like you said, most of my story, I can only share with pictures. I, I can give you a lot of data, but I can give you a better story when I share my pictures because my children inspire me. But each of these beads are a procedure, hospital stay, therapy, medication challenge. They, they each tell a story of where we are in this journey. And they always remind me that it's a lot bigger. Today, my problems may just be like, oh my God, I just want the doctor to get me this medication and CVS is not helping me with it. When I look at this picture, I'm like, hey, We've done so much, we can continue to do this, but it also gives me purpose because a lot of times physicians or industry don't understand the day-to-day -day struggles that we have. And this sort of, for me, captures everything in, in, in one picture because it's like each of these were what my child went through, but in reality, the whole family experienced it. 
Um, and so that's my son. And, the, and, and on the right, the reason I did this, took this picture was because Ira passed away when she was four um, and we wanted to keep her legacy going. So I took her beads and I took this doll that was done as a replication of her. And I went to our local elementary school where she would have gone if she had uh, started school. And I took that picture and I said, you know, no matter what, you will continue to inspire me and um, your legacy doesn't end just because you're not here. So our beads of courage don't, you know, we don't have more to add to her beads, but her being here was our, our strongest and most powerful courage. So with that, I, I in my story, and I hope you all um, could take something from it and find useful. <laughs> Thank you, Parvati. We appreciate you being here to share your story. And now I will turn it over to Caitlin Laws, who will uh, moderate the next session. Hello, everybody. My name is Caitlin. I'm the RDLA coordinator at the Every Life Foundation, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So we are going to hear from some really fantastic people today. I'm pulling up my notes. Um, but again, my name is Caitlin. I've been at the Every Life Foundation for a year now. Um, before coming here, I went to American University where I got my master's in public policy. And before that, I went to Appalachian State University. Um, my connection to rare disease comes from my grandmother and my aunt who both have um, a rare eye cancer. Um, so I hope you all are able to Think of your connections today when you're hearing about how powerful advocacy can be from our two speakers. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce them to you now. So the first speaker is going to be Allison Bones. Allison is the president and CEO of Team Travis. Team stands for Together Ending Asplenia Mortality. She founded the organization in the months after her four-year-old son, Travis, died from an undiagnosed rare disease known as isolated congenital asplenia. It was never detected that Travis was born without a spleen. This primary in immunodeficiency leaves children vulnerable to life-threatening infection. In his memory, Team for Travis provides education, awareness, and advocacy. One of their long-term goals is to change the way the spleen is detected through prenatal or newborn screening. Allison brings to the organization a marketing degree from Baylor University and 13 years of progressive experience working at GE Capital. In the last two and a half years, she has become a champion for rare disease advocacy, serving on RDLA's advisory committee and being featured in Engaged Health's Rare Disease Difference Maker and Uplifting Athletes blog. So Allison, we will go ahead and hear from you. Thank you, Caitlin, and what an honor it is to be here. Parmathy, you are a hard act to follow, but I can, I can only hope that I fill half of your shoes. Um, and thank you, Caitlin, for the introduction and for sharing my screens. Um, let's click to the second screen, please. Well, as Caitlin said, my son Travis was just a healthy, vibrant, energetic boy. He was always happy and he drew people to him wherever he went. The first year that he had played t-ball, one of the other dads on the team came up to me at the last game and he said, you know, I just have to tell you, I have never seen Travis without his smile. If he's standing at bat, he's smiling. If he's running the bases, he's smiling. If he is out in the field, he's smiling. He just, this was a kid who had a huge collection of friends and uh, just went through life, loving life and just happy, happy to be alive. Next slide, please. As you can see there, we had 45 friends celebrating his fourth birthday. That's, this, this kid was love and he was loved. So you can imagine my surprise, next slide please, when just six days after that birthday party, uh, and we were still actually kind of reeling, just kind of getting our feet back on the ground because five months earlier, my husband had died of colorectal cancer. And so my world turned and amid my grief, I knew I had to, everything to do with Travis was now on my shoulders and on the amazing group of friends that I refer to as my tribe. But so all of these people came out to his fourth birthday party and he had a blast. 
six days later, he was dead. And so my journey into rare disease advocacy is a little bit different. I didn't even have time to, uh, to do any advocating for Travis while he was still alive. And that is why I'm so passionate about Team for Travis right now. It's, it's the way that I have to continue being his mom. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, how did we find out the diagnosis? Well, uh, on a Friday morning, just the Friday after his birthday party, Travis was swimming and playing. He was having a, just a blast, his usual typical day. And uh, that night he started saying, Mama, I'm cold. Well, we live in Arizona. And in August in Arizona, if someone says they're cold, you know that something is really wrong with them because it's hotter than the surface of the sun. And uh, so he started vomiting, he had a high fever, and he was fine on Friday night. I checked in with a friend who is a nurse practitioner, and I checked in um, with his own pediatrician, and they both said, oh, it's probably just the flu. And um, then, next slide, please. So these were some of the common reasons that we heard for Travis's illness. Um, you know, it's probably just the flu. Well, you can have urgent care test him for strep throat, but I really think it's just the flu. And uh, even his own grandparents said, you know, kids get fevers. Ours always did. They were always fine. And uh, unfortunately, everyone was so wrong. Uh, next slide, please. So three different medical professionals saw Travis in that 20 hour period. And uh, all they were looking for were the hoofbeats from horses. And I learned as I got involved in the rare disease community, they really should have been considering zebras because yes, the symptoms Travis was presenting did mimic just the common flu, but no one ever considered the underlying cause for that fever, that it was sepsis brought on from a bacterial infection that Travis couldn't fight because he didn't have a spleen. So next slide, please. And uh, he was never diagnosed as having isolated congenital asplenia. We had no clue. We, in fact, we always thought he was pretty healthy. And during his life, we were always so busy protecting his father's immune system as he battled colorectal cancer that I think Travis wound up being the beneficiary of that, and um, his, his immune system was able to overcompensate, and he was able to fight off common colds and things like that. But then when this haemophilus influenza type A, which is a bacterial infection, hit his bloodstream without his spleen, he was left completely powerless. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd share with you really quickly some fast facts about asplenia. It is a genetic birth defect. So there is a genetic component to it, which is interesting because half of the children that have been studied, or half of the people who've been studied do not express the mutation. So there's likely another mutation responsible for asplenia, and that's part of our efforts is to continue fundraising to contribute to research to discover that second mutation. Another fact about asplenia is the spleen is missing, or like in Travis's case, the medical examiner discovered there he only had a small remnant of a spleen. There is another scenario in asplenia. The spleen may be present and show up on a all kinds of ultrasounds, but it's non-functioning. Asplenia is also, as Caitlin mentioned, it is a primary immunodeficiency. And without the spleen, kids, everyone really, but this mostly strikes children. Children are susceptible to life-threatening sepsis, and it's currently not detected in prenatal ultrasound or newborn screening. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Oh my goodness, this is the wrong, hang on just a second. <laughs> Let me share my screen. And if you'll stop sharing for a minute, for some reason, this is the wrong presentation and my sincere apologies, but let me pull up and share my screen. Bear with me just one moment. This is the correct one. I'm not sure how that happened, but so we were on that slide. Can everyone see that? Okay, thank you. So what Team for Travis is doing is we are raising awareness. We've participated since February of 2019 in rare disease day events and advocating to members of US Congress to garner their support and build relationships so that we can draw awareness to asplenia and all rare diseases. We're also working with the Every Life Foundation's newborn screening working group and serving on RDLA's advisory committee, just to help educate people how to be a better advocate for their loved ones with rare diseases like asplenia and trisomy 18. And uh, we also are advocating for expanded genetic testing and newborn screening. We are growing our patient community. That's one of the biggest challenges with a rare disease is how do you find other people you have the same disease as you or have the same disease as your child. And sometimes you strike out. Sometimes um, one example where we did strike out, I found a paper published by a doctor, a pediatrician at the University of Minnesota. And he was talking about a young girl who they did diagnose her with asplenia and she survived and uh, Unfortunately, this child was a ward of the state of Minnesota. She was in their foster care system. So in terms of making a connection with that family, we struck out. But we have had a couple of really solid hits. I, I still am waiting for that Grand Slam home run, to use a baseball analogy, but we have made contact with moms of children with asplenia in Norway, Germany, uh, here in the U.S. in Boston and Florida. And uh, so we are slowly growing and, and finding those connections to help strengthen our patient community. And we also are fundraising to contribute to ICA research. Some of our activities, as you can see, we have held fundraisers at local restaurants. Um, on the left there, there's a couple of our board members and uh, it was really cute. One of Travis's young friends came out with his parents to the restaurant and he took it upon himself to make little packets of all of our materials. And he went around to diners in the restaurant and stopped at each table. And this child was five years old at the time, but he stopped at each table and he said, excuse me, I'd like you to read this about my, and my friend Travis who died of a rare disease. And he would give the diners our information. And um, so you're never too young to start on advocacy. And then we also have participated in in-person advocacy. Uh, there you can see uh, me with a team of fellow advocates from Arizona with our then Senator Martha McSally. We've done virtual advocacy. This was just in February at Burr Across America Week, and there's one of our other board members and me and another rare disease patient advocate speaking with a representative, uh, Chad, from David Schweikert's office. So, and then one of the projects that is just really unique to us, one of our dear friends um, is a creative type. She makes her own jewelry, she sings, she teaches piano and um, gives music lessons to children. She came up with this idea of kindness rocks. And uh, so we started painting these little flat landscaping rocks. They had to be orange because of course that was Travis's favorite color. And uh, we've started this campaign and these silly little rocks have gone around the world. There you can see one um, that a friend took on a mountain hike in Norway. We've had them in South Africa and 
throughout Europe, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and the Philippines, and all 50 of the U.S. states. Uh, so it's just been amazing to see how, how people have gotten involved with something that a couple of our board members thought, oh yeah, right, little kindness rocks, that's not going to go anywhere. Well, Travis made those rocks go around the world. I'm convinced of that. And so um, let me know if you'd like to have an opportunity to spread some Travis love to and, and we'll get you a rock. But uh, one unique story that I think is amazing, uh, one rock was taken to a city in Denmark and then a little boy there found it. It's the rock, let me back up, the rock started in Phoenix it went to San Diego. A little boy found it in San Diego. And after hearing Travis's story, he decided he wanted the rock to go far. So he gave it to his uncle. He was going on a business trip. And I said Denmark a minute ago, but it was actually Norway. And uh, then the rock got left in a small village in Norway where it was found by a family from England. And their little boy took the rock home to England with them took it all around throughout their two-week holiday throughout Great Britain and uh, they took pictures of themselves with the rock in different historical sites and then they posted about it to our Facebook page so I invite you to check out the um, hashtag spread Travis love Facebook page and you can see just where in the world these little kindness rocks have gone and <laughs> My big takeaway for today I'd like to leave you with is just get started. It's been said that a journey of a thousand miles begins with just one step. And so I'd like to just encourage everyone, don't be afraid to take that first step. And, you know, I, I think it's very interesting. Long winding roads are seem to be a common theme among the rare disease community, like with Parvati showing her idyllic beachside scene and that's what they expected parenthood would be like and then uh, a rare disease hits them and makes them feel like they've just been in a 20 car pile up and that's certainly the way I feel and I'm, I'm not going to lie there's ups and downs there's twists turns and bumps and some really big potholes but you can start by doing just one small thing and uh, making your voice heard, sharing your story. Get involved and get out there. Uh, Global Genes is a great resource for the rare disease community, the Every Life Foundation, and also NORD. Uh, and that's the National Organization for Rare Diseases. Build those relationships with the medical community. We didn't have the opportunity in Travis's case. Uh, for us, his rare disease diagnosis came too late for me to advocate on his behalf to save his life. But I do what I do to prevent other children and other families from losing their child. So, you know, Google is both a good thing and a bad thing, but if it's used correctly, you really can find a wealth of work information out there. So. If you're wondering if, you're, if your disease has an organization already, do a Google search. And uh, if you consider starting one, if you don't find one that exists, like I had to do with Asplenia, let me know. I'd be happy to give you some pointers. And uh, you can see those are just some of the amazing connections that I've made with people in the rare disease community. And again, like Sarita, we just clicked because we were in the same breakout room during a preparation for Rare Across America in February. And I'm so excited to share her journey with her. And I'm so honored that she invited me to be part of her journey. So, and don't forget to effectively tell your child's story or your own story. Social media can be a great way to share the story. And also if you, uh, do have a nonprofit organization. One thing that we've done, I didn't realize this, but um, Canva, which is a website that allows you to do design creations of social media posts, brochures, everything. It's a fantastic site and um, anyone can use it for free, but they do have an upgraded 
um, membership, you can purchase that. But if you're an existing nonprofit organization uh, with your 501c3 status from the IRS, you can apply for and receive up to 10 Canva Pro user licenses for free. And you can find more information about this program um, on the Canva website, and I can drop that into the chat room too if anyone's interested. So that was one of my favorite pictures taken of Travis and me in the last weeks of his life. And uh, again, you can see that megawatt smile. And there's my contact information as well. So thank you, Sarita, Green, and especially Elijah, that precious child. And uh, I'm so thrilled to do anything I can to, to work to share their message at the same time I'm sharing Travis's. Thank you. Allison, thank you so much. Your presentations are always just so heartfelt and so touching. And I, we all really appreciate you being here with us today and sharing Travis's story and your own about your advocacy and how you've begun this journey. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Caitlin. Absolutely. Now we are going to hear from Shannon Von Felden. Um, Shannon is the director of the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates, which is a program of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. She works with rare disease advocates across the country to engage at the local, state, and federal level. She began her career on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant for Congresswoman Shelley Berkeley, working on healthcare and veterans affairs issues. Shannon has worked with national nonprofit organizations to further their policy and advocacy goals, including the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and National Osteoporosis Foundation. She received her master's in public policy from American University. So Shannon, we will hear from you now. Hello, thank you so much, Caitlin, for the introduction and to Sarita and Kareem for having me today. It's a pleasure and as always, um, I love working with Allison. So this is uh, so wonderful to be on a panel with her today. I'm Shannon Von Felden. As Caitlin said, I'm the program director of the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates Program here at the Every Life Foundation. Um, a little bit about the Every Life Foundation. You can move on to the next slide, Caitlin. Oh, I guess I did. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the power of patient advocacy. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Every Life Foundation and RDLA, um, information about how powerful your advocacy is, how to even get started in advocacy and ways to get more involved. So the Every Life Foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization located here in Washington, DC. And we're dedicated to empowering the rare disease patient community to advocate for impactful science-driven legislation and policy that advances the equitable development of and access to life-saving diagnosis, treatments, and cures. We don't speak for patients. We really believe that patients are the best advocates. So what we believe, um, we believe that no disease is too rare to deserve a treatment, that rare disease therapies should be safe and effective, and that we can do more with the science that we already have. So our foundation has a number of policy goals, but I'm going to talk to you today about the highlighted in blue, empowering patients to develop an impactful voice in policy making, drug development, and regulatory decision making. And I know that's a lot of big words and can seem really overwhelming, um, but I promise it is not complicated. So a little bit about RDLA, uh, we have three main goals in our program. We want to educate patient advocates about legislation and policy to make it as simple and easy as possible to become more involved in that process. We want to build awareness on Capitol Hill and ensure that Congress 
hears directly from patients and caregivers. I would add to that that we also want to make sure that um, all state legislatures are hearing directly from patients and caregivers as well. And a big goal of ours is to connect every member of Congress with a rare disease advocate so that when they're considering legislation that impacts the rare disease community, um, they realize that it's not just about treating a disease that's saving a person's life and a person that they've met. I think that there's a lot to learn from history. Um, and the AIDS movement was just such a unique and revolutionary moment, especially uh, for the healthcare community. Um, people were laying down in front of the FDA. Um, that was the top left picture there um, with these signs that were tombstones saying that, you know, if the FDA did not act to approve treatments for HIV AIDS, um, literally they would be killing um, people. Um, real people. And so this was kind of revolutionary, holding the FDA accountable for their process and their regulatory system. Next slide, Caitlin. And so through that activism and the AIDS movement, um, literally FDA was forced to create a whole new process for approving drugs and it's called the accelerated approval. Um, there were new regulations allowing for surrogate or biomarkers to determine if the drug is effective. Um, and really what this did was it reduced the time and cost of the development of drugs. And so following this change at the FDA, there was the biggest surge ever in innovation. And it just really highlights the power of that advocacy. Um, Next slide, Caitlin. And one of the most important lessons was that these patients in the HIV AIDS movement who were educated and activated were the, the far greater advocates for change than paid lobbyists. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway is that um, advocacy and activism can seem really intimidating, but, but truly you are um, the most important component to ensuring change um, for the better for the rare disease community. So there might be many reasons that you advocate um, for yourself, a loved one, a community. Um, you might advocate to educate lawmakers or to solve a problem. Um, you might advocate because legislation, public policy impact healthcare for you and your loved ones from um, closing the gap um, in the number of treatments there are for rare diseases, eliminating the diagnostic odyssey, which can be you know, six or more years for many individuals, improving that regulatory process. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, and then making sure that there's access to the safe and um, effective therapies as soon as possible, because it's not enough for us to develop the treatments and have the FDA approve them. We need to make sure that patients can access these therapies, whether that's um, through um, private insurers or other ways. There we go. Um, and so you have the power to affect change. That's really the power of grassroots advocacy. Um, and there's many ways to be an effective advocate. You just have to get started, like Allison said. So taking an active role in the political process, influencing, influencing legislation policy, speaking up when you hear um, something that might impact you, um, speaking up, telling your story, and um, you are your best advocate. No one can tell your story like you can or share your experiences. And I know that many people feel like their legislators in Washington DC don't wanna hear from them or don't care. Um, but as a former staffer for a Congresswoman, I, I want to kind of dispel that. Um, they really, I think that many members, get into um, 
into government um, really from a good place of wanting to um, help their communities and help others. Uh, so I just want to remind you all that when you when you do want to speak to your legislators or their staff that you are the constituent um, they're going to want you to vote for them in the next election not a surprise there um, and also you are the expert and so that is definitely of importance to your members of congress and their staffers or your state legislators um, to hear about your experience as a rare disease patient caregiver um, and, and learn from that experience um, because you are the expert in your experience. And these relationships that you develop with your legislators is so important. This was a survey that was taken a few years back by the Congressional Management Foundation where they surveyed uh, members of Congress and their staffers. And so you can see that in-person visits from constituents had the most impact on how that office might um, work on particular issues or vote on legislation. Um, so building those relationships is really key to being influential with your member of Congress. Um, and, and I like to say that during the pandemic, I, I think Zoom visits, we can, we can uh, substitute for in-person at the moment until we're all back. And this is just how basically how a bill becomes a law. And I like to point this out only because um, I think it just shows all the different points in which there are opportunities to advocate. So um, you shouldn't think of your advocacy as a one time stop and you do it and then you're done. There are so many points in time in which your advocacy is really critical or that um, that you're able to um, speak up. So, um, you know, from the bill being introduced to it being in committee to committee markups, um, all the way to until the bill gets to the floor of the House or the Senate to be voted on and then signed into law. So these are all opportunities um, where advocates can get involved in the process. So what are kind of the keys to being an advocate? Um, I think most important it is to create those relationships with your state and federal legislators, sharing your story. And what's so important about this is you wanna have a, have a goal when you're going in and have that ask. Um, always have something that you want them to do, um, something concrete. Um, whether it's co-sponsoring a bill or voting for or against something or sending a letter or contacting Health and Human Services on your behalf, there's, there's always an ask, something concrete for them to do so that um, they can check it off their list of whether they've done it or not. And ask questions. Asking questions is a great way to engage with your elected officials. Ask them um, questions about, um, you know, how they can help you with your journey, what they're doing to improve certain situations or conditions. Um, that's a great way to continue to engage with them. And then like you're doing today, engaging with organizations to support you. There are so many rare disease organizations out there and finding other organizations to support you in that journey is so critical. And one thing I love about the rare disease community you hear so often that um, advocates will help others with their um, priorities, even if it doesn't impact them. So sending those action alerts on behalf of another organization, um, especially if they do align is, is, such a, is such a nice thing to do. And then activate your own network. If you're gonna advocate, if you're gonna send a letter or an email to your legislators or call your legislator, ask your family, ask your friends to do the same, especially when it comes to these email action alerts, it couldn't be easier for others to do it, especially if, if they have personal connections like yourself or your child. So how do you get started? I think the number one way to get started is determine what your goal is. Um, particularly if there's a problem you need solved, uh, whether it's insurance coverage for a treatment, needing an FDA approved treatment, needing a diagnosis, um, 
funding for research. There are so many different problems that need to be solved. Um, and it can be as simple as uh, wanting to raise awareness and education about your disease. Uh, that can be a great place to start. It's just making sure that your legis legislators know um, about your rare disease and how it impacts you. And that's a great way just to start that conversation and start that relationship. And to engage with your legislators, um, get started um, by determining whether this is a local issue, a state issue, a federal issue. And once you've determined what your problem is, what kind of, where you should be going, to, um, you know, at the state level, you'd want to talk to your state legislators and your governor. If it's a federal issue, you want to talk to your federal representatives in the U.S. House of Representatives and your senators. And as you become more sophisticated and advanced in your advocacy or as a bill, for instance, um, or particular issue advances, you may want to start reaching out to the committees of jurisdiction, um, members of the leadership committee, um, and so, you know, there's there's so many different um, ways to engage with them, but don't forget that their staffers are a great resource. Resource, of course, it's great to meet with the member of Congress themselves or the state legislator, um, but their staffers are the ones that are really doing that day to day work and have the ear of the member of Congress or state legislators. So, um, they're great resources, and building relationships with them is. Um, even uh, I would say as important, if not even more important than building relationships with the members themselves. And then, you know, when to engage with your legislators, you wanna build that relationship over time. Um, and then if there is, there are particular issues um, that are important to you, don't waste time. Don't wait until it's too late and then regret that you didn't make sure to let your elected officials know about the issue sooner. Um, I always think back to a meeting I had with um, a group that um, wanted us to co-sponsor a bill and so we did. And after the fact, another group was mad at us for doing that. And I said, well, I never heard from you. You never told me that you opposed the bill. So, you know, they don't know until you tell them. Um, so make sure um, to, to be active and vocal um, anytime and all the time. And another great thing that people don't always know is that you don't have to come to Washington DC to meet with your members of Congress. They live in your state or in your congressional district. So that they're home about half the time of the year and you can schedule meetings with them during their district work periods. And one of the things I loved about Allison's presentation was outlining all the different ways that she is involved in advocacy. There are so many different ways to do it. I love those kindness rocks. Um, and so I just encourage folks to, um, you don't have to do it all. And sometimes it's best to um, know like what your strengths are or what you're comfortable doing, for instance. I know some people are great writers. So um, writing a blog or an op-ed is a great way to become an involved in advocacy. Um, some people are, are super mavens on social media. I am not one of them, but that's another great outlet for advocacy, making posts, tagging your elected officials. Um, you know, and then it can be so as simple as making a phone call to your representative's office or sending an email. Um, those are great ways to get started, especially if you're really busy or your health isn't so great right now or you're busy with your children. Um, so no matter how you engage, um, it's just great to make it as personal as you can. Continue to tell that story um, when you're writing or calling your elected officials, make sure they know who you are, where you live, um, and that you're a constituent. You can keep going through these, Caitlin, all the different ways to engage. Perfect. And then I mentioned scheduling a meeting. So whether you want to meet with your member of Congress in Washington, D.C. or at home in the district, it's pretty simple. Um, I would say it's can be as simple as scheduling a doctor's appointment, although that's not always easy as my dentist won't even return my call right now. <laughs> so 
Um, but we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, you can go to our website, our take action page on the everylife.org website. Um, we have a platform on there where you can find your state and federal officials by just typing in your zip code and your address, finding your legislator's name. You can find their office phone number and give them a call and let them know that you're a constituent and you'd like to meet with the staffer responsible for healthcare and whether they have a process um, for requesting meetings or the best way to do that. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's even better to supply them with specific dates and times when you're available to meet. So it can be easier. Um, this is something that is part of their job um, as staffers who work for elected officials. That's part of their job is meeting with constituents. Um, so you shouldn't hesitate to do that um, anytime. And when you do meet with your legislators or their staffers, um, I always encourage folks to find ways to connect. Uh, you can really easily research your legislators these days by looking at their website, check out their press releases page. You can see what are the issues of most importance to them or what they've done recently, um, as well as their social media pages. And you can also try and find personal um, ways to connect with them, what you have in common personally. You're from the same state, the same district. So there's a chance you went to the same high school, the same college. Um, you might root for the same baseball, <laughs> football teams. Um, and so um, that never hurts. Um, I also, when I meet players, I like to say, when I introduce myself where I live in our city. I live in DC on Capitol Hill, right near Lincoln Park, and my kids go to such and such school. And so they can really see where I am in the community, where I live, what community I'm involved in, um, and can really picture that. Um, and then just remember, there's never a reason to talk politics when we meet with our members of Congress, especially about rare disease uh, issues. Our rare disease issues are not partisan political issues. And so just keep that in mind that the rare disease issues are bipartisan and we're the rare party. And that's what's important. And then social media is really an amazing advocacy tool. Um, for one thing, you can do it from home, which makes it super easy. We're all on our computers these days anyway. Um, but it's such a great way to bring attention to the problems that you face. Uh, if they're not keeping an eye on their social media pages, which many legislators are um, very active themselves. They have press secretaries and communications directors who are keeping a very close eye on those social media pages. So you can create posts and ha um, tag them, create hashtags um, to make them aware of the problems. And then you can also thank them for actions that they've taken that um, you ask them to take or are happy that they did. Thank them for any meetings that they or their staff provided. Um, sometimes working for a member or being a member of Congress can kind of be a thankless job. They take a lot of heat for a lot of the work that they do from their constituents or from other stakeholders. So when um, you're able to thank them, when you're able to be that like nice, happy, smiling person who appreciates the work that they're trying to do, that can make all the difference and can, can really make them want to help you. Um, and then, you know, tag the member with your photos um, that you take with them at meetings. And then I will say that advocacy um, persistence is definitely necessary. Um, you have to keep at it and keep going. Um, so when you do get that meeting with your member or staffer, make sure to follow up with them with emails or a letter or a social media post. And then just continue to engage, sign up for their newsletters, look for in-person or virtual events like town halls or I know my city council member um, does a lot of coffee chats where he sits at a coffee shop for an hour a month and constituents can drop by. Those are great, easy, um, very uh, non-intimidating um, ways to engage. And then look for action alerts on legislation that you wanna support or oppose, make sure to send those 
And then of course, just thank those members when they do um, act in ways that you've asked them to do so and stay in touch. Um, you know, you don't wanna email or call them weekly, <laughs> uh, but you know, I think every month or two, you can give them a little update or if there's a news article or some interesting new information that uh, might be helpful. Healthcare is such a huge topic. Um, at the state and federal um, levels. So, you know, they can always use more information to help with their decision making. And if you are interested in being an advocate, uh, RDLA tries to make it as easy as possible. So you can sign up for our monthly newsletters and webinars at rareadvocates.org, as well as free events. We have monthly webinars that highlight state and federal legislation. The whole website serves as a legislative clearinghouse. So you can find action alerts there. Um, our monthly newsletters share information about what's happening on Capitol Hill and other events in the rare disease community, like today's event. We have a state advocacy hub. The state legislation and state advocacy is of interest to you. We also have a ton of resources and tools for advocacy, our tip sheets, our policy primers, our videos. If you just want to take a look at it, um, you can actually go to rareadvocates.org slash tools just to see what's there. Um, and then, of course, you can check out our calendar and Facebook and Twitter accounts, too. And so our big next steps in advocacy, uh, you might have heard of it, is Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Um, and that is happening this summer, July 14th to 22nd. And you, if you're interested, can register at rareadvocates.org slash RDW. The deadline for registration is June 18th. And this is a photo from last, Rare Disease Week, which was in person February of 2020. And we're, we're hoping we'll be able to finally get back to in person next year. So this July, we're hoping um, to have the same life-changing experiences, even with the new dates and the new format being virtual. Next slide. So if you've never been to Rare Disease Week or heard about it, uh, here's a list of the events that we have during the week. Um, we do a Rare Disease Caucus briefing and documentary screening. We hold a legislative conference over two days. It'll be in the afternoons, it won't be full days so that people can participate. Um, and that's just an opportunity to learn more about policies that impact the rare disease community, network with fellow Advocates, we're gonna have a couple different opportunities to do that during the legislative conference um, and just learn how to better be an advocate. And then we also have some opportunities for young adults, if you know any young adults um, who wanna get more involved in rare disease advocacy. And then the following week, we're gonna meet with our representatives and senators over Zoom. Um, and that's a really great opportunity. Um, to get started in advocacy. If you've never met with your members of Congress, we schedule the meetings for you to make it as easy as possible, group you with the other rare disease advocates from your state and district uh, so that advocates aren't alone in a meeting. Uh, and then we're gonna end out the week with diversity roundtables on July 22nd, um, which will really highlight some of the um, issues facing um, the rare disease community in underserved communities. And something really unique and fun for Rare Disease Week this year. We're really excited to be able to support the community during Rare Disease Week. That's actually really important to us as a foundation that we're supporting patients and organizations. Um, so we are going to give advocates um, the opportunity to earn points throughout Rare Disease Week from joining events and sessions during legislative conference or other events during the week to putting your picture up on your profile to attending your open office hours ahead of our disease week um, and you'll earn points and then the top 50 point earners will win between one thousand dollars to five thousand dollars for their organization of choice and the donation will be made 
by the Every Life Foundation in their names following Rare Disease Week. So it's a great way for advocates to get more involved and benefit uh, their rare disease organization. So you can register at rareadvocates.org slash RDW. And if you're interested in attending the Hill meetings, make sure to click um, and register for the Hill meetings and all the other events that you would like to attend. And again, we will register and schedule those meetings for you on the Hill. And you can select to meet, um, to have your Hill meetings on the one day or both days, depending on your availability. And then if you do register, make sure to register for our training webinars ahead of time as well. And then another great program for advocacy, um, I talked about meeting with your uh, members of Congress in the district. We have a program where in the August recess, when most members are home during that August recess, uh, we schedule meetings for advocates to meet with them in the district offices or state offices. Um, we're not doing it this August because we're doing Rear Disease Week in July, uh, but we will be back to hosting that event uh, next year in 2022. So keep an eye out if that's of interest to you. And if you have any young adults, I um, that would be 16 to 30 years old. I would really encourage um, you to check out hereasyard.org um, to learn more about our young adult representatives of RDLA program. Um, it's a really great program um, that trains uh, young adults to become more involved in advocacy, public speaking, um, as well as great networking opportunities. So that's it from me. Thank you guys so much for being here today and then giving me the opportunity to talk to you more about advocacy. Uh, if you will have any questions for me, feel free to email me at sbonfelden at everylifefoundation.org. And if any of this was of interest to you, you can check out our webpage for advocates.org or find us on social media, Facebook and Twitter and even Instagram. That's it. Great. So much information. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Thanks. So many ways to get involved. Totally. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, we are actually going to hold a short break until 1210. Um, there will be a video playing during the break. So please enjoy that video while you take a little rest from Zoom. Um, get up, stretch, whatever you need to do, but be back at 10 after 12. Thank you, guys. Okay. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. I hope everyone had um, a good break as we're starting our second session. Um, I am Shanae. I'm the Zebra Coordinator for the Ewe Foundation. Um, and Zebra um, is the comfort um, care program when with the foundation. And it's the end of life solution to families living with Edwards syndrome, which offers resources, interventions, counseling and bereavement support to those in need. Um, and again, our website is the eweefoundation.org if you wanted more information. Um, and again, just to let you know if you have any questions, put those in the chat and we'll definitely um, answer your questions. And if we don't get to them in today's session, we'll definitely follow up um, with an email. Um, so our first speaker on today, I'm gonna introduce her. Her name is um, Kirsten Angel, and she is the Associate Director of Advocacy for the National Organization of Rare Disorder, better known as NORD. Kristen oversees the Rare Action Network um, called RAN, a program at NORD, and RAN is a grassroots advocacy arm of NORD. She works with rare disease patients, families, organization, industry leaders, medical professionals, and elected officials spanning across all 50 states on public policy and advocacy innovations to improve the lives of those impacted by rare disease. She has over 15 years of advocacy and volunteer policy 
um, advocacy and volunteer management experience. She's also devoted to empowering individuals in the community to advocate for change and to raise awareness. She is also a freelance graph designer for over 23 years and regu regularly lends her design and nonprofit expertise to numerous charity organizations within her own community. She lives with her family in Southburg, Connecticut. Ms. Um, Kirsten Angel, the virtual floor is now yours. Thanks. So it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit today about um, who NORD is, what we do, and our um, Rare Action Network program, uh, and hopefully get some of you involved with it. I'm going to share my screen now. Just want to make sure you can see it. You guys see that okay? Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm with the National Organization for Rare Disorders. We are a um, organization, we're an umbrella organization that represents the entire rare disease community. And I'm going to share a little bit about how we do that. Um, NORD is an independent nonprofit. Uh, we support patients and patient organizations by accelerating research, providing education, <clears throat> disseminating information, and driving public policy. NORD was actually founded um, in the early 80s after a group of patient leaders, patients, and caregivers got together um, and advocated for what is still uh, in law today, the 1983 Orphan Drug Act that President Reagan signed into law in 1983. Um, in that left picture that you can see, that is our founder, Abby Myers, um, who actively worked on this legislation with the other patient organizations and representatives in the rare community to advocate for um, the Orphan Drug Act, which gave an incentive to pharmaceutical companies to want to explore um, research and developing treatments for rare diseases because they at the time were not being um, developed. There was very limited uh, number of FDA approved treatments for rare disease because they did not necessarily bring in the dollars. So this specific Orphan Drug Act offers a tax incentive for pharmaceutical companies and some exclusivity rights uh, to kind of entice them into the rare disease research. Um, and it has uh, significantly increased the number of FDA approved treatments over the years. Um, and it is still something that is always uh, potentially in harm's way, this Orphan Drug Act. Uh, and so we continue to do advocacy efforts surrounding the Orphan Drug Act to ensure that it stays as is. Um, over recent years, it did change a little, but um, we still work diligently to ensure that the Orphan Drug Act stays as is. We represent 25 to 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. Um, the definition of a rare disease is it, it affects less than 200,000 of the U.S. population. It's a slightly different number in Europe. Um, there's approximately over 7,000 rare diseases, and 90% of those rare diseases are without an FDA-approved treatment for that specific disease. So these are the different areas that NORD actually works in the rare disease space, public policy and advocacy, which I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, we have direct patient services and patient service programs for patients and their families. Um, we work on capacity building with nonprofit patient organizations. Um, we have a research and innovation um, department. We have a research department that works on numerous uh, research funded uh, and, and grant funded um, research programs, which are, are just amazing. And it's actually growing every day. I can't even keep up with the amount of uh, research work that we're going into. Um, community engagement. And then public education. We offer um, educational webinars for the rare disease community, everything from like something like genetic testing 101, understanding what genetic testing is, um, things such as that. We usually host one um, once every month on, on various topics and they're free for the public to join. So I'm specifically here today to talk a little bit about our Rare Action Network program, which is our grassroots based advocacy network um, it really is a volunteer run program. Um, and, I, it, and I emphasize that because of the work we've been able to do in the states over recent years, you know, a lot of healthcare decisions are being made at the state level. And while NORD has always contributed to federal policy work, 
um, and advocacy efforts. And, you know, we've, we've done cap days down in Capitol Hill in DC to advocate for things. We realized very quickly over recent years that there was a need to do the same things within the states. And each state is unique as to the laws and, and healthcare um, access for all. So we developed the Rare Action Network program to help identify volunteer leaders that we refer, we refer to as our volunteer state ambassadors in the various states. And they kind of represent as a liaison between what's happening in the state and NORD. Um, and actually today I see that our newest, one of our newest uh, RAN ambassadors, our Alabama Rare Action Network ambassador, Benita Moyers is on the call today. And uh, Benita, if you wanna, put a little uh, chat with your contact information. So those of you in Alabama that want to get more involved with the RAND program, you know, please do reach out to Benita. Um, and we have ambassadors across, I believe now we're in like 38 states, but we have RAND members across all 50 states and Washington, DC. Um, it's a great program. We have our rareaction.org website, which offers up information on the policy work we're doing in the states. Every state has their own state profile. Um, and I know I'm talking to the folks in Alabama today. So rareal.org would be the Rare um, Action Network for Alabama's website. Um, and you can take a look uh, at the Action Center in the various states. Um, the contact information for our state ambassador would be on that page, on those state pages. Um, we, we do state hill days, we do rare disease day activities throughout um, the, the country around rare disease day in February. Um, we do both state and federal advocacy campaigns within the states. Um, we do advocacy training, education, and just awareness programs as well for the community members. And that's where um, our volunteers such as Benita come in to play uh, currently you know, with the world we're living in, we're all in a virtual world still. Uh, so we've been doing some virtual rare discussion groups um, in the states that have kind of gotten together with the rare disease community members just to hear how this pandemic has impacted um, them personally in their state and see if there's ways that NORD can assist in some of the issues they may have been facing this past year and a half. We also put out, um, we publish every year a rare disease um, report card for every state. So you'll be able to see how um, Alabama holds up in certain uh, initiatives and I'll cover those pretty quickly. But these are kind of the, the policy issues that NORD focuses on at large. There's a lot of underlying topics and issues that go along with these, but just to give you an idea, um, access to affordable coverage is an important one, um, affordable, affordable medications, access to diagnosis and a timely diagnosis take on average um, for a rare disease to be diagnosed between five and seven years, um, access to innovative medicines and therapies, advancing rare disease research and regulatory science. Um, COVID-19 is obviously a big area we're focusing on now. Um, rare disease advisory councils, and I do, uh, I know, I believe we'll be hearing from the Alabama RDAC later uh, as well. Um, telehealth and the state of the state's report card that I just mentioned. Some of the things that NORD advocates for that differentiates us from the disease specific organizations is when we determine an issue that we're gonna focus on, um, there are common challenges across the rare disease community that everybody faces regardless of the actual diagnosis. Um, I mentioned the, the average diagnosis time, the 90% of rare diseases don't have an approved treatment, um, high costs of treatment and medical care. Uh, there's few medical experts and they're located you know, across the country, sometimes the world. Um, there's little research known about the diseases, social isolation, and small scattered patient populations. So these are common, common challenges. So when we're looking at initiatives that we focus on, we want to look at issues that impact the rare disease community at large or a large portion of the rare disease community. And we work with our patient organizations to work on specific disease um, initiatives and, and giving them advice and, and direction. Um, some examples of the federal policy efforts that we've worked on is obviously the Orphan Drug Act, uh, Newborn Screening Safe Lives Act, Medical Nutrition Equity Act, um, Protecting Patient Access to Affordable Health Insurance and Telehealth. And then some of the state uh, issues that we focus on in the state report card specifically is Medicaid financial eligibility, medical nutrition, newborn screening, 
prescription drug out-of-pocket costs, protecting patients in state Medicaid programs and state regulated insurance programs, um, step therapy, and rare disease advisory councils. So this is all things that the state is graded on every year. Um, we've just published this past February our sixth edition of the state report card. Um, and I have the link on the screen. It's rarediseases.org slash Nord State Report Card. Um, you, can, you can find that, or you can visit rareal.org to link to the report card for the, the Alabama specific one. Um, and what we do with our advocates, you know, joining the Rare Action Network is a simple form. You form up, you, you sign up for online, and then you become in contact with anything happening in your state by putting in your, your address. Um, we're always looking for stories uh, to share with elected officials on the impacts that rare disease has on their constituents. And we encourage you to meet with your legislators and develop relationships with them. Um, and we help guide you on how to establish those relationships. Um, we also encourage bringing awareness to your community by joining the Rare Action Network. There's opportunities throughout the year to um, you know, highlight the rare disease state that you represent, but also representing the rare disease community at large. Um, I encourage all of you today to sign up. You can go to rareaction.org and hit the join button and you'll get in touch with any activities happening in Alabama or if you're from out of state, uh, your state that you reside in. Um, and we host events year round. So hopefully you can participate. Some are virtual and hopefully someday soon we'll get back to in-person events as I'm sure we're all hoping to do. So I would just encourage you all to, to join the Rare Action Network. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody may have. But thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to hear about our program and our organization today. All right. And thank you for that information. Um, and definitely everyone, like she said, make sure to go to rareaction.org and hit that join button. All right. And now we will have, um, now we will have um, a video by Dr. Bruce Korf. He is the assistant dean of Geometric Medicine at the UAB School of Medicine, Chair of Alabama Rare Advisory Council. But we also have, and he is in clinic, but we also have his assistant, Ms. Lauren Hicks with us today. Um, and she will uh, give us some information. Ms. Lauren, the floor is yours. Hey, Shanae, thank you. He is actually here. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I have clinic today and was in and out of clinic and, um, it turned out, luckily, we were able to carve out about 15 minutes. So I actually will be here live. Um, and let me share my screen and I'll pull up a slideshow. All right, well, I hope you can see the slide then. Um, I was asked to comment about the Alabama Rare Disease Advisory Council and um, my role is as um, chair of the council. I'm associate dean for genomic medicine at um, UAB and a medical geneticist. So I have a lot of um, experience over the years in diagnosis and management of um, individuals with rare disorders. Um, so let me very quickly review for you the charge to the council. I'll introduce you to the members briefly say some words about <clears throat> activities and um, kind of ways that um, the council can interface with the rare disease community. Council was formed uh, as an um, act of the state legislature in 2017 with these five um, elements of um, charge to the council. The first is to just discuss strategies to improve understanding of the diagnosis, treatment, and impact of rare diseases, then to collect data about rare diseases, including cost and economic impact. Third, to coordinate rare disease collaborations across the state, including academic medical centers, investigators, funding agencies, biotech companies, and advocacy groups. 
forth to highlight collaborations and synergy between clinicians and investigators, academic medical centers, state and federal funding agencies, biotech and pharma companies, and nonprofit research and medical institutions. And finally, to report findings to the Alabama legislature. There's some stray numbers here um, due to the way this was copied, so I thought I edited those out. Um, annually with the goal to address changes in rare disease policies that will positively impact citizens in the state. All right, so that's that's what um, we're supposed to do. I'll, I'll say now and come back to this point, um, there is no budget attached to this council. So we are all volunteers and everything we do is volunteer effort. So we don't have any funding from the state or from anybody else. We did get one contribution, a donation um, about a year ago almost now. Um, and that's helped us um, with a few projects that you'll hear about. But otherwise, um, this is a um, lot to do with um, relatively little budget, well, no budget really to work with. So here are the members of the council. Now, the, the membership categories are determined by the, uh, the bill that was enacted by the legislature. It, it involves representatives from the major um, academic centers in the state, UAB, um, in the University of Alabama system, um, University of South Alabama, and Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, which is not a um, academic institution, um, but a nonprofit institution um, focused on genomics, which certainly is important in the study of rare disease. There are patient advocates who are on the council. And we also have um, two state senators and a bioethicist um, participating in the council. The membership is um, three-year terms, the first of which now is, is, is completed actually for everybody. And um, these are renewable times one. So I guess everybody, except one person just recently was um, named to the council, but otherwise we're in our second terms. Now, I'll just quickly mention a, a few of the things that we have been doing and highlight a few in, in subsequent slides. Um, we, we are supposed to meet quarterly and we do, um, that's been um, done pretty regularly since the um, initiation of the council. In the early days, we met face-to-face -face at UAB, and because many of our members were um, coming from, from a significant distance in the state, um, even in the early days, long before COVID, we did create a video conference link that those that couldn't make it here in person could um, participate. Obviously, since COVID, we have not been able to meet face to face and we've been doing it entirely by Zoom. And to tell you the truth, I think it's worked exceedingly well to the point that I'm not sure we won't just continue that um, indefinitely because um, representing the state, which is a, a large um, area, this is a pretty big state and could take somebody six hours to drive from one end to the other. Um, the Zoom meetings in this case actually have worked quite well. and. Um, I'm sure we'll at least keep that option open. And I could imagine we might even make that the kind of mainstay of the meeting. So not a question we've had to face just yet, but I think it might be coming. We try to start each meeting with a um, presentation by a patient advocate, either as a person who personally is, is affected by a rare disorder, or um, oftentimes it's a parent of somebody or family member of a person with a rare disorder. We have really found it helpful to provide that perspective at these meetings. I think the members of the council really appreciate it. And um, I guess it all helps to keep us kind of focused on why we're there. Uh, we actually have communicated with the um, state public health lab about newborn screening. It's been an area of interest and um, the um, state um, commissioner of public health does serve as a member of the council. Um, at the time when we started, there, there was a um, transition taking place in terms of leadership at the State Department of Public Health and there was a new facility being um, instituted and Alabama was um, lagging on introduction of some of the um, tests that other states had already adopted. 
Um, I think most of that has been rectified. It's been, to be honest, a little bit challenging getting um, full engagement during COVID for obvious reasons. I think they're, they're um, very much immersed in the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we, I wouldn't have expected them to be as engaged in um, work of the council as um, they were, or, and as we hope they will be. The council has played a big role in um, helping to organize our rare disease day activities. Say more about that in a moment. Um, we're really excited about the resource manual that we've put together and I'll show you something about that. And, um, you know, Alabama rare is, I'd say the major force um, for um, patient advocacy and rare disease in the state. And a task force has been set up that Swapna uh, Kakani, who is um, the leader of Alabama rare is chairing to look for ways that we can synergize more closely with um, Alabama rare and with the rare disease community in general. These are screenshots from the rare disease day symposia that we held this year. We've been doing one every year since um, 2014 um, on or about the um, rare disease day. I guess it's generally commemorated the end of February. Uh, and in the last couple of years, the the council has played a role in terms of um, organizing the agenda and Alabama Rare has um, spearheaded the second day. So it's a two day event and it has been for the last few years, um, generally a Friday and Saturday. And the Friday is a um, an event that mostly targets um, professionals that would be physicians and nurses and genetic counselors, other health caregivers, as well as researchers. And it's usually a thematic kind of um, day. And the theme this year was next generation technology and its role in managing rare disease. And you can see the agenda um, here. We were talking about um, genome sequencing and new techniques in genome sequencing, bioinformatics. Um, telehealth, of course, has become a big thing in the past year, spurred by COVID, although we were beginning to get into it even before COVID. Um, discussion about health disparities, which is a concern across medicine, and certainly it is as well in rare disease. And each year we try to have what's called a parent panel. It's really a, a panel discussion of, um, could be parents or um, adults who themselves have a rare disease. Um, basically just kind of talk about their journey and are available for a Q&A session. We always have a keynote speaker this year. It was David Feigenbaum talking about his efforts to develop treatment um, for his particular rare disorder. The second day, which Alabama Rare um, took responsibility for organizing, is um, focused on patients and caregivers. Um, on, um, as you can see, coping as an individual and a family, um, particularly in the context of some of the challenges of the past year, but in general um, as well. Um, helping people with advocacy and, and community building. And then we had a talk by a, a um, state legislator. This year, because of COVID, the entire thing was done virtually using Zoom. We also did have a kind of a cocktail hour um, at the end of the first day. Here too, you know, I think Zoom proved to be extremely successful. Um, although I, I think we would be eager to get back as, as soon as we can to some kind of face-to-face -face thing. Given again, what I mentioned earlier, this is a very, very large state with big distances between places. Um, it, by virtue of it being um, on Zoom, we were able to bring people in who might not have been able to make the trip here. And it's possible that we'll look for ways to create this as a hybrid meeting going forward. Um, I guess that remains to be seen. I mentioned that we've created a resource guide. I think one of our early perceptions was that there's a, a lot of stuff available in the state that people might not be aware of. And, you know, in essence, this was meant to be a kind of user's manual um, for people so that it would be a single place they could go to, to learn about some of the things that um, either are available to them or just about um, principles in general. So, this is a screenshot of the table of contents, um, defining a rare disease, uh, word about diagnosis, um, use of social media, um, how to get the most out of um, the relationship with your healthcare provider, 
talking to family members, dealing with financial issues. Um, what does it mean to be participant in clinical research? And then there's an appendix of what we thought were useful resources. Um, we've also created a website, which um, yeah, I guess I'm using a version of the slides I forgot to um, update, but the URL is pretty easy. It's Alabama Rare Disease, I think just council. Um, Dot org and um, I can't remember now if advisory is required in there or not. I'll double check that before we're done. But um, anyway, it should be pretty easy to find and it has pretty much all the contents that are in the uh, manual. Plus you can download the manual. Um, oh, you know, I am using an obsolete version of the slides. Let me actually, because there were a couple others I wanted to show and thinking that I wasn't going to be able to be here. I did record a video and I guess what I must have done is move the actual final version of the slides to another place. If you give me a second, I can find it because it has the um, the last couple of slides that I was hoping to show. So it's going to take but a moment. Okay, back to sharing. And let me just, oops. Here's the URL I was referring to, which um, I was right, it doesn't have advisory in it. So that's, it's a long URL, but not too hard to remember. This is what I wanted to show. Um, you know, it's just a screenshot from the resource manual on the left are some rare disease facts on the right. Uh, we put together as best we could a compendium of rare disease clinics throughout the state um, and um, what the contact information was for these. Now, this is a bit of a fluid thing because clinics tend to change over time. And I'm only showing you the first of several pages of this, um, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, we'll try as best we can to keep it up to date, but we hope that this would be a resource that people would find useful. All right, so the last slide, I just wanted to end with, you know, kind of a compendium of things we found challenging and things that we're hoping to do. Um, I said this earlier, but I think it bears repeating. It's an unfunded um, kind of council, and so everything is volunteer effort. Everybody on it has, you know, lots of other things they're responsible for um, professionally and personally. So I will say it takes longer than I wish for lots of things to happen, but that I think is what happens when, you know, it's not anybody's full-time job to um, make sure the council is, is doing its work. So, um, and some of the things that we were asked to do, like to, you know, assess the economic impact is it's not a trivial undertaking. It, it's a study that would be a fairly challenging one to do and pretty hard to do um, when you have no funding. Um, so we've tended to focus our efforts on things we thought we could make a difference with that um, the resources we did have would be supportive of. Um, we feel like it is going to benefit everybody if we can strengthen the ties with the rare disease advocacy community. And I think that's the rationale for the task force with Alabama Rare to see where there's um, synergy that we can establish um, with that group. We really do feel there's a lot of power to individual stories that's certainly been visible to the members of the council from the um, presentations done before each meeting. Um, one thing we're interested in is, is seeing if people are willing to share their stories even on our website, because um, I think people can learn a lot from um, hearing about the journey others have, have had. We're also interested in building some educational materials. Um, we have already, of course, in the form of the resource manual talking about genetic testing and clinical trials. Uh, we're looking to do some um, brief videos that would be available to people to learn about some of these things as well. There's probably a lot of stuff out there on YouTube. Um, I think if we can aggregate things that are specific to our community that will be helpful. And a long-term goal, challenging one to be sure, is to um, create more of a statewide network with public health clinics involved and advocacy groups across the state 
so that people with rare disorders in Alabama don't feel alone in their journey and know that there are groups willing to support them. So I think I will stop at this point and um, hopefully have left a few minutes. And if there are questions, I certainly would be glad to um, try to answer them. So thank you. So at this time, um, I'm going to introduce Mrs. Christine Mattis. And Mrs. Christine Mattis is the um, owner and founder of the Mattis Law Group. Christine was admitted to the bar of the state of New Jersey and to the U.S. District Court of New Jersey in 1995. Christine is a member of the New Jersey State Bar Associate, Association and a bar of trustees of the Ocean County Bar Association. She is also a member of the Asian Specific American Lawyer Association and the American Bar Association, where she serves on its advisory panel. She's dedicated to public service. Christine is an active mediator with the Superior Court of New Jersey. Sp um, Special Silvis Park, a volunteer for Caregivers Inc. And at this time, Mrs. Mattis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you, everyone. I really, what a pleasure to be here. This is such a milestone event. I think it's just such a wonderful, wonderful time for everyone to get together and share their knowledge and education uh, with each other. My dad always says, if you walk away from a conference with learning at least one thing new, it was so worth it. I always tease him. I said, are you just placing that bar real low, you know, so, but it, it's a good thing. So again, I'm just so happy to be here. Um, you know, it, I've always had a passion for helping families, especially those who have a special needs loved one. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, first and foremost, I'm a wife, I'm a mom. And uh, my two children are really my passion of what I do. And that is the same thing I see with Sarita and, and with everyone on this panel that I know there is an, there's a real reason why we do this. Um, so my oldest is 13 going on 25. I mean, uh, they mature so quickly. And my youngest, uh, Juliana is 11. And Juliana was born with Down syndrome. And really, that is one of the reasons why I decided to dedicate a majority of my practice to helping other families who, like I said, have a loved one with special needs. And I always find it so important to be able to share as much information as possible because when my husband and I had learned about Juliana's condition, I'll tell you, so that was, you know, 11 years ago, which isn't too far along ago, but really I think all of us have seen, um, there's so many changes that have happened during that time. So at that time, internet was pretty good, not great. Um, and just getting information of what we could do to care for her. What can we do thinking forward? What can we do to protect her and protect our family? Uh, and it was challenging, it was really hard um, because again, finding the right information, finding the right people to connect with um, is sometimes daunting. And there were times that, you know, and I'm a lawyer. And so I would meet other friends who are lawyers and they were great and they had a heart of gold. But I think if you don't do this area of law enough, you don't do it frequently enough, the details can become murky, can become complicated. So there were times I heard one thing and then I would kind of look it up on the internet, hear another thing. And then I talked to another colleague and I heard another thing. So it was getting overwhelming and daunting. So I decided, let me take matters into my own hands. Let me learn it. Let me learn it for myself so then I can maybe lead other families in the right way. So I've always felt that again, knowledge is power if you use it. Those are always those last three words that I've always felt is very essential to that phrase because we can take in as much information, but if we don't do anything with it, it really doesn't do much to help other people. And one of the things I thought that is very interesting is um, exploring the topics of what can we do to protect certain assets for our loved ones so that they can qualify for certain benefits. I think all of us know that we are dealing with loved ones who may, not all of them, that may be looking into benefits that are what they call means tested. Those are benefits that are based really upon the assets that they have in their name. You're looking at Medicaid, you're looking at SSI, 
And those are really powerful benefits for our loved ones because when they get to be adults, there are times that they may not be able to manage on their own. So they're going to need some help. And one of them is getting these types of benefits. But again, they're means tested. And Sarita have heard me before. It drives me crazy. But the uh, the platform, the means to get these benefits is really low. I round the figure. You can't have more than $2,000 a month to get these type of benefits. It, it's a little higher. But that number hasn't changed in such a long time. It's really disturbing. But that's the cards we deal with, right? So if we are to get these great benefits, Medicaid for our medical insurance, for our loved ones, SSI, which is supplemental social security income, um, the amount so far around here in Jersey, around 863 a month, you know, and that's what it's valuable money, important money. But again, we have that low threshold. So issues occur where our loved ones may come into money and as a result might throw them off that benefits. So it's this awful battle that we have where we want them to do things. We want to give them things, but then we're dealing with this interesting threshold because of those valuable benefits. So what can we do? So there are tools available, and that's been my mission to make sure parents knows about tools that are available. And there's quite a number, thank God, and over the years, over the last 11, I, I, my milestone is 11 years. So since Juliana's born, I've been able to track all the good things that have been happening. And they're really good. There's lots of tools that are available. So the main tools I thought I'd like to at least make sure parents are aware of so that they can explore and look into, because maybe this is a fit for them, um, are, are available. So one of the things you might wanna look into is something called a special needs trust. A trust is just a tool and I picture it as a box. And there's actually so many different boxes and I can do a lot of things with this box. In our purposes for today, there's something called a special needs trust, which is a box. And we can put things in that box and it will be not counted against our loved one when they want to apply for Medicaid and SSI. There's actually three types of special needs trusts that are popular. And it depends on where the money's coming from or who is going to manage it. So the more popular one that I have for my daughter, it's called a supplemental needs trust. So parents, if you're listening and loved ones, take notes hopefully you have a pen and paper, you're going to look into a supplemental needs trust, also known as a third party trust. Why do I say third party? Because again, we're looking where the money comes from and it's coming from other sources that don't belong to the child. So the one I have for my daughter, Juliana, is a supplemental needs trust, third party trust. So the plan is right now we're taking care of her. She's living with us. We're caring for her. But God forbid something happens to my husband and I, we want to leave money to her and her sister. So the plan is, God forbid something happens to both of us, 50% goes to Emma, big sister, and 50% goes to supplemental needs trust. Doesn't go to Juliana, right? Because if I'm leaving her more than $2,000 and she's supposed to be on Medicaid, she's going to lose it. And they're going to say, well, use up all the money. And when she's down to two, 2000 reapply again. And again, parents, I know you're going to say, yeah, it sounds so easy. And you're not going to get those benefits overnight. So there's going to be a stretch of time with no benefits, no money. It's going to be a nightmare. So look into this trust because it's a great way to plan ahead. If God forbid the worst happens and we want to leave something for our loved one, it'll be put into this box. And that money cannot be touched, will not be counted against our loved one. And they can use those funds for vacations. They can use those funds to buy the iPad. They can use those funds for, for many things. So that's something to think about. There is something called a first party special needs trust, not to get too technical, um, but it's called first party because that's money that's already belonging to the child. Examples, child support, surprise, surprise. Unfortunately, if we're in a situation where a marriage is being dissolved and one spouse is supposed to pay child support for the benefit. It's really the child's money. Child support is considered the child's money. And what if they're on Medicaid and they're on SSI? And if they were to receive this money, if it goes more than 2000 in a month, again, we're going to have a problem. 
So what do we do? I can build a box again, but it's called a first party trust because it's really money that belongs to the kids. It wasn't coming from any other source. It, it belongs. That's how child support is labeled. It's the, it's an asset of the child. And again, it'll be non-countable so the child can continue to receive benefits and continue to receive child support. There are a lot of more stringent rules of how to use the money when it's in that first party trust. But the basic goal is keep benefits and let's get the child support. You know, those are the things that really break my heart when I hear parents come to me and we're helping them and they're just like, oh, I wish I can get benefits, but you know, I have the child support. And I'm always like, oh, we got a tool. We got something for you. Another example, say you receive a settlement. We have situations where we have families and their child was involved in a terrible, say, auto accident, devastating, life-changing. And as a result, they probably will now be qualified for Medicaid and SSI, but then they're getting this huge settlement. And that settlement will also throw them off their benefits unless we use the tool, right? We use the first party trust. So these are things to be aware of because it is break, heartbreaking when I find parents and we're talking and they're saying, yeah, I didn't have benefits for this amount of time. And I'm like, oh, what happened? Oh, because there was a car accident. We had the settlement. So you know, we had to run through the money and now we're back again. And I always think, oh my gosh, we could have had both, right? We could have had both. We could have had the settlement money and we could have had, still had all those benefits because I don't know how a lot of other families are, but I can tell you from my point of view, with the amount of care we give Juliana, with the medications and things like that, no matter what the settlement is, no matter what the inheritance is, you're gonna run through it. Medicine is expensive. Trips to the hospital are expensive. So without that other benefits, if we need it, it's really you know life transforming and it's stabilizing for the child. So it's very, very important. So that's just one thing to consider. A new thing though I wanna share that a lot of you probably heard about is something called the ABLE account and that's Achieve a Better Life Experience. And that is really a great tool that came out quite recently. It really wasn't that too long ago, we didn't have it. It was in 20, I believe 2018, we just were able to use this tool. So what is it? It's an account, kind of like a savings account. And the ABLE account, again, you're able to put funds in there and you're able to make sure that whatever's in those funds are not countable and won't disrupt benefits. Now, why would we use one versus the other? Well, the ABLE account has some good benefits, but it does have restrictions we should be aware of. One of the things we should be aware of is that you can only put up to $15,000 a year in that ABLE account, and it can accumulate up to say 100,000, then we start to lose benefits. If it accumulates 200,000, you really lose all benefits, those means tested benefits. So you gotta be aware. And if God forbid the child passes away and there's money left in that ABLE account, that does go to the state. Whereas the third party trust, right? The first trust I talked about, God forbid something happens to the child. If there's any money left, you as a parent can designate where the balance go. It can go to another sibling, another relative, a charity, you have control over it. Whereas the ABLE account, you won't be able to. So it's just something to just to be mindful about, right? Um, I've found ABLE accounts very useful when I have a loved one who is probably able to work a little bit, maybe earn a little money, you know, not enough to disrupt their benefits, but they can do something. So they'll use that account. And if they have some capabilities, then maybe that might be something they can manage, you know, have a little sense of entitlement and ownership and learn a little bit of uh, money management. But if not, a parent would be able to manage those monies for them. But yeah, an ABLE account. And one thing that's interesting is that you can only have one ABLE account. You might have a well-meaning grandma or a well-meaning relatives like, well, I'm going to open an ABLE account for you. If you have more than one, one of them is going to disqualify. One of them is going to have a problem. So you're going to have one. So you have to have a good family meeting to make sure we're all on the same page. And again, ABLE accounts are almost similar to a 529 college savings account. If we're familiar with that, um, you'll realize that it's a way to save money, just like the ABLE account. And there's so many different kinds. Each state has their own 529 plans. So you wanna explore with these ABLE accounts, what's a right fit? Cause there are, every state has their own. Um, and it's interesting to know what 
kind of changes that they have with each, what kind of drawbacks they might have or some pluses. So you just have to do your homework. It's not just, I don't think it's feasible just to op- go to a bank, just open up an able account, explore, just explore. But again, you know, these are just great tools that as parents that weren't available, you know, 10 years ago, no, it, was, it wasn't even heard of. So I'm just so glad that we're able to at least explore these things um, and at least to see what's available to help our loved ones maintain benefits or get qualified for benefits and help our loved ones in the long run. Um, and one of the other things too, is that, you know, when I look at a trust, um, besides being qualified for benefits, I think all of us are also more concerned about protecting our loved ones there's a lot of predators out there, you know, and at least a trust, we're going to nominate someone to control that money for our loved one. We're going to nominate someone to guide them and, and make sure the money grows, the money's used properly. Because, uh, you know, I think all of us have read in the news that unf- there are just some unscrupulous people out there. And if we don't have enough uh, uh, guards to help our loved ones, bad things happen. So we just want to be mindful of that. But, you know, I was just excited to be here to share at least those main tools that we could uh, chat about and maybe explore why, you know, uh, they're so useful and why people, when they find out about it, really are very excited because these are tools that really should be used for everyone. And no matter what state you are here in the country, that's an available tool. You really should look into it. Um, ABLE accounts and the special needs supplemental needs trust those are those are really important um but i didn't know if anyone had any questions because i know it's a lot of information but it's it's exciting to me and i i'm always excited when i hear about new things that are developing to help our loved ones um and and there's just so, so many good other things that are available to them to help guide them Thank you so much for that information. Um, That was a lot of information, a lot of great information um, on these things, because a lot of us, we don't know what to do or even where to start. And I I thank you for that. Okay. And then I'm going to introduce now Dr. Charlie Steen Somerville. Um, um, And he's a, a native of Birmingham. She's a native of Birmingham and received her doctorate from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2013. She completed internal medicine and pediatric residency in 2017 and serves as the chief resident during her final year of residency. She is now a dual board certified internist and pediatrician and and as an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and Department of Pediatrics. And she currently serves as the program director to the MedPed residence program. And now the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, Welcome everybody. Can you hear me? Great. I am going to share screen um, so I can share a little bit about what I have been doing. Um, This is a huge shift in gears from that wonderful last talk. Um, My focus is um, really on healthcare transition. So um, a huge part of care for all of our, oh, it's sharing with subtitles, that's okay. Um, So my my huge focus in practice has really been um, how to care for patients and their families across the lifespan. And that's really why I did my training in pediatrics and internal medicine. Um, I truly wanted to um, understand the Oh, it says I'm paused. You can't see my slides, can you? You can see them. Uh, we could see the, yeah, we can just see the, uh, like the, the outline piece of it. There you go. This, well, is it moving forward? It's moving now. Yeah, it's okay. moving um, sorry. So, um, so yeah, so my passion has really been caring for patients across the lifespan um, and more specifically really looking at um, transition. So um, particularly, particularly for patients who have diseases of childhood and, and complex diseases, um, how do we help them move into the adult world as they grow? And um, as we see, um, you know, so many incredible parents like our last speaker and like Sarita Edwards, um, who have learned to be such incredible advocates for their families, um, that period of time where they are getting older and having to make big changes in their medical care and related to insurance and so 
social work support, how can we really support families um, during that difficult transition? So that has been really um, my focus at UAB and Children's in Birmingham is that I really in my personal practice noticed that this was a huge gap um, for all of our patients at Children's and really throughout the state of Alabama that this um, was not being done in any sort of formal way. Um, so I paired up with Betsy Hobson, who um, has really been an expert in transition work for patients with living with spina bifida, um, and we look to really use her work to apply to all of our patients living with any complex disease. So the background, I don't need to spend much time on. Everybody here is well aware um, that there are a lot of adolescents and young adults who have chronic diseases that are living into adulthood um, and that really um, a lot of national organizations have called to put more attention and resources into transition. Um, so my work started specifically looking at Children's of Alabama in Birmingham um, and really doing a deep dive to ask all of the specialists at Children's, um, how do you feel like you're doing with transitioning your patients to adult medicine? And to be honest, um, I don't think anyone would be surprised that most of them felt like they were doing a really bad job. Um, you know, Children's does such a great job of providing that multi multidisciplinary care. They're incredible doctors. Um, they hold your hand through some of the most difficult decision-making and um, medical things that you'll have to think through as a child, um, but then they're not really equipped to prepare you of what is that next step as you get older. Um, and so you can see here, these were some of the common themes and quotes that came out of our deep dive. Um, and this was from leadership um, at Children saying that they felt like their patients had no formal transition plan. Um, really, if you look to the bottom, some people said that they felt like their patients regressed or did worse after leaving Children's. Um, and, and some even said that they thought that we coddle patients and their families too much when they're children, and that makes the transition more rough. And so this really triggered a bigger high level discussion of how can we make sure that our families are making this transition successfully and how can we prepare them so that they don't feel like they're just being cast out into um, a dark hole or falling off a ledge is how some parents have described it to me when they're leaving children's. Um, so this just looks more at specific diagnoses and specific diseases where um, the children specialists kind of rated who they felt like they were doing a good job transitioning. You can see on the left um, some of the diseases that they felt like they were doing a better job with. These programs had already set up transition programs. So for patients with cystic fibrosis, spina bifida, sickle cell disease, um, they really already had transition programs up and going. And then if you look on the right, um, groups that scored less than two, which is really not acceptable, um, included a lot of rare diseases, rare genetic syndromes, um, underlying um, you know, GI issues, cerebral palsy, um, patients with neuromuscular disease, patients with sleep disorders, patients with lupus. So again, common diagnoses and things that we are used to caring for at Children's, but there was truly no plan for what would happen to these patients when they turned 18 to 21. And this again, just highlights a lot of different rare diseases that where patients really had no transition plan. Um, so all of that, um, we knew there was a need. We put it on paper um, and we applied for a large grant to actually build a transition clinic um, that would help create this transition program and planning and policy for all patients at Children's, not those with just specific diagnoses. Um, and we were awarded that grant funding in addition to health system support and were able to start what's now called the STEP program. Um, so this stands for staging transition for every patient. And it was a huge collaboration of lots of people at UAB, um, other national institutions and lots of departments throughout the pediatric and the adult world to make this successful. So what do we actually do in the STEP program and what have our goals been? So um, those of you who are familiar with policy and, and transition work and advocacy, the first step is really having a policy, right? Like when do you transition? Who transitions? Who, who stays at Children's forever? Um, because at the, at the 
you know, basis of all of this, the goal is to truly provide the best care to every patient. For some patients that may be staying at children's until they're at an older age. You really can't apply the same rules to every single patient. Every patient comes with a, an individual story. And so how can we make a policy where we keep that in mind? Um, the second part was really building that bridge from Children's to UAB. Um, if any of you have been there, there's a beautiful bridge that attaches those buildings, but there's not necessarily great communication as people move across that bridge. Um, and so how can we create really a landing pad for patients to enter into smoothly with coordinated care and make sure that you're making that transition when it's best for your family? Um, and so that is what, what we've done with the STEP clinic, which I will tell you guys more about in a minute. Um, the third piece has been developing relationships with the specialists on both sides and really understanding who are the physicians in all of these specialties who are the right fit for our patients with rare disease and complex disease. Um, you can all agree after probably having met a lot of doctors and a lot of different places that um, there are truly um, angels and star healthcare workers who have a passion um, for patients with rare disease and who are committed to researching and reading about the newest outcoming data and studies. Um, and those are the people we want to work with and make sure that we're connecting our patients to. So we make that a huge point to have meetings with physicians all over the health system to identify who are the right specialists for our patients. Um, the fourth was partnering with existing transition programs. I mentioned there are several around the country at Rochester, Baylor, Cincinnati, who we've um, really learned from and who've been great partners in this work. Um, the next piece is really looking more into the community. So how can we partner with adult providers, urgent care doctors, hospitalists? Um, because we know even in, a special, in one specialty clinic at UAB, we're not gonna be able to care for every patient um, and that we're going to have to do a better job of training all of our residents and medical students and um, community doctors to be able to care for patients um, with any underlying complex disease. Um, and then we've looked at IT development of transition tools and how we can really better prepare our teens and young adults or their families for the transition. So with STEP program, there's really been two components of this. It's across Children's and UAB, as I've mentioned. The first is at Children's. Um, so at Children's, we've been working to create a framework within all the specialties to really start having the discussions at age 14 for most of our patients and their families of you know, starting to think about that. What is that gonna look like for your child when they turn 14, 15, 16? Um, you know, is, is the goal for your child to be independent and living on their own and having a job? We need to start thinking about those things now and how to make sure that we're utilizing resources and giving our children the skills. Um, for others, the goal may be um, care planning or, um, you know, extra resources in the home to provide more care. Um, a lot of shifts occur with insurance and, and um, all kinds of resources when patients turn 18. So how can we start to think about what shifts may happen at 18 and make sure that we're thinking about um, you know, disability and insurance and um, waivers and all the supports we can put in place to make a family successful. And then I mentioned at UAB, um, we created really this landing pad um, called Step Clinic. And so this is our clinical component of the program that sits within primary care at UAB. Um, we felt like it was really important for our patients um, as they enter the adult world to be seen in an adult medical care setting with other young adults and older adults um, and really know what it feels like to be in an adult medical practice. Um, our criteria for patients, as you can see, are really loose. We really want to be able to provide resources to any family in need without restriction. Um, so really, as long as the patient is over 18, um, we're seeing people from all over the state in any chronic disease of childhood, regardless of insurance. Um, so really trying to remove barriers and making sure that no matter where your family is at in this journey, that we're there to help kind of guide through. Um, chronic disease of childhood, these are examples of a lot of what of the patient of what we're seeing in our patients, but truly it can be anything. 
um, such a wide range of conditions. Like I said, the focus for us is if you are a family in need of resources related to transition, no matter what that disease process is, we're gonna be there to help guide you through that. So what do we actually do when you come to clinic? This is what families and patients wanna know is what's gonna happen when we come over there. And um, it can be really scary meeting a new doctor, especially when you've had a lot of um, doctors and healthcare experiences in your life, some that have been amazing and some that may not have been so amazing. Um, and so really we have a dedicated team. We get all of the records from children so we can know exactly what happened when you were a child and what um, your medical struggles struggles were. Um, we do a series of screening just around mental health for our patients, um, around caregiver burden for our parents, um, so that we can make sure that we're also helping our parents plug into resources. Um, and then we create an ITP or what's called an individualized transition plan for every single patient. Um, and what this looks like is really a focus on goal setting for the patient and family. So um, we typically will make a goal about ar around medical care. So, um, you know, what, what are the referrals you're going to need? Let's sort out, you know, which of your doctors may still be at children's, which may be in the adult health system, which may be in the community. Um, really making it clear where all of your medical care is and organizing that for a family um, because transitions of different doctors can happen at different times. Um, the second piece is we really just want to get to know our patients and families and understand what is the key to their success or making them happy. Um, so we let the patient and parent each make a goal that we help hold them accountable to. And then we pick a goal that's really specific to um, what their transition planning is. So for a patient, for example, who um, really has relied on mom, let's say, to make all their medical appointments and to make them take their medicines every day, um, how can we work with that patient to get them starting to take the steps to um, really own their own health care? And so we set a goal around that. Um, and then for some of our parents, if they're struggling with finding resources, the goal could be around, how, around helping the family plug into community resources. Um, so again, it's really individualized to the patient. Um, we, we take care of any referrals to adult specialists based on um, who we think would be the best fit for you and your family. Um, we communicate with those specialists and make sure that they know that you're coming and that they know your story um, and so that we can make that as really seamless as possible. Um, we handle all primary care needs. So if you're needing basic labs and shots and um, just management of basic medical issues, we can do that. But some of our patients have um, primary care doctors closer to home and that's okay too. Um, we, we spend a lot of time making sure our patients know where to go if they get sick, right? If you're in the middle of a transition, um, it can be really complex. Like, well, wait, my pulmonologist is at Children's, but my stomach doctor's at UAB. So how do I know where to go now? Um, if I get really sick, which ER do I show up to? Um, and so we spend a lot of time thoughtfully thinking about that as well so that our patients aren't lost in the process. And then we have an amazing social work team who spend probably a, an hour with every patient at their first visit um, talking about a lot of the things I mentioned. So, um, you know, resources for vocational rehab or for, um, you know, things that you may need related to school to be successful. Um, we spend time talking about guardianship and, go, and helping families kind of figure out how to put that onto paper. Um, and then for some of our families, we just talk about goals of care and, and what the rest of life is going to look like. Um, and so really, again, just very holistic approach, head to toe, um, you know, thinking about all the medical, but also, again, how can we help you succeed in your personal and professional life as you get older? The other thing to just add about this um, is that for specific disease processes, we do have specialists come to clinic with us, um, which has been really incredible in reducing barriers to patients getting to see their specialists because you guys would all agree for, for any adult, um, it's really difficult to get to multiple different doctor's appointments on different days with different people. Um, and you add more complexity or barriers into that and it's nearly impossible. Um, and so we quarterly have um, uh, epilepsy doctors and neurologists come with us. We have rehab doctors come to clinic with us. 
We have a neuromuscular specialist. We have a pulmonary doctor and a renal transplant doctor. Um, and so these doctors come into our clinic and we are very, we coordinate that we see the patient with those specialists um, so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page about care. Um, I mentioned our social work and care coordinator team. We also have a physical therapist in clinic with us who can do physical therapy in clinic or who can help us just with equipment needs and uh, making sure that power chairs and other equipment are all functional and up to date. And then we have lots of community partners and are really working strongly right now on having a counselor in clinic with us. Um, so the clinic is located at UAB um, in the John Whitaker building. I mentioned this already really um, right in the center of where um, the adult primary care clinics are. Um, and this is how you set up an appointment. So um, basically anybody, a family member, a provider um, at Children's or UAB could initiate this process. And really um, all you have to do is call the UAB Access Center at the number I have on the screen and you can schedule a new patient appointment. Um, and if you have questions or want to talk about more what we offer and if it's the right fit, um, my email is also at the end of this talk, and I'm glad to share. You can certainly email, and we can have somebody call to talk more about the clinic with you. So as of today, we opened this clinic about 10 months ago. We um, have now established over 150 new patients as of this week, over the last 10 months. Um, and I already mentioned some of the um, specific clinics we've had with all the specialists joining in, um, and it's, it's truly um, been an incredible adventure for me. I always knew this was um, something I was passionate about, but to see other healthcare providers all over the health system um, be so passionate about this topic and wanting to come to clinic with us and um, even hearing from specialists this week asking to come to clinic more with us because they love getting to see patients all together and have so many different brains um, in the conversation. Um, it's just truly been meaningful. And I think um, for the families, it's, take, it's given them such a sigh of relief um, that they know that they have a team that is going to be committed to them, who's going to help them through this. Um, um, and not let them um, certainly fall off any cliffs or ledges while they're making this transition. Um, and then these are things that we hope to achieve um, by giving this level of care to these patients. So improving access, making sure our patients can get to all of these doctors, um, decreasing ER visits and hospital stays, and then really helping our patients improve their readiness for transition, um, improving our patients and families' quality of life, and improving our patients' ability to care for themselves and take ownership of their health care. Um, and then the last piece I think is might be the most important, which is just increasing education locally and nationally um, about the work we're doing so that more physicians are comfortable um, caring for all of our all of our family members and patients as they age. Um, and lots of future growth. Um, Children's is looking to build a complex care program and we're hoping to help be a part of that and have it really flow naturally into the adult world um, and, and looking at lots of educational opportunities and creating a patient advisory board so that we can make sure as we grow that we're really meeting the needs of our patients and families. And so with that, I will end and take any questions. I have my email right here. Like I said, please feel free to reach out if you have questions or if I can give more information um, about the work that we're doing. Um, and I will just end by saying thank you for having me and, and letting me share the work that we're doing. And thank you all for all for everything that you're doing to advocate on a higher level for these patients. Thank you, Charlie, for that information. Very informative. I learned so much, and I think that is so amazing, um, the information that you just shared. Um, and at this time, I'm going to um, turn it over to Kareem, um, our Vice President of Operations of the Foundation, to, give, to close us out. Thank you. Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, I am Kareem Edwards, the Vice President of Operations for the Elijah Wayne Edwards Foundation, also known as the EWE Foundation. Um, I am Elijah's dad as well. Um, and Elijah is a, is, is a very vibrant, um, charismatic, if, you, if I could use that word, um, little boy with trisomy 18. 
Um, he has a lot of complications that, that goes with his diagnosis and uh, makes it difficult at times to care for him. Um, but it's always um, easy when we think about the love that we have for him. Um, it also makes it easy to advocate for him. Um, so uh, my job is to, to thank everyone. Uh, so we really appreciate um, all of our participants, um, the speakers, I uh, really appreciate uh, the knowledge that you've shared. Um, we appreciate the various stories that were that were uh, shared with us, um, and to uh, all of our participants in general. Um, we'd like to thank the Every Life Foundation for, first of all, their um, uh, rare giving sponsorship that made this whole thing possible and allowed us to to present it at no no charge for any of the participants um, in addition to that, um, we thank them for their participation and, and sharing of their knowledge and the resources that are available. Um, also I'd like to, to uh, offer to anyone who is, a, who is uh, qualified, you, there are CEUs available. Um, and if that uh, identifies you, feel free to contact us and we'll be glad to email you out that um, certificate, the award certificate. Um, I'd also like to inform you that you can uh, contact us or connect with us sorry, on uh, social media. That's uh, Facebook, um, that's Twitter, Instagram. And uh, here lately, we've generated a podcast. Uh, it's called Being Rare. So uh, anywhere you listen to your podcast, you can find um, the Being Rare podcast. Um, and be on the lookout for a um, a one minute Monday every single Monday, uh, where Sarita shares the um, uh, a minute or sixty seconds of uh, some some really really good information. Uh, lastly, I would also would like to thank her. So um, so Sarita is one amazing individual, and for all of you who have who have connected with her, you know that. Um, you come to realize that she is an amazing individual. So we, we really wanna thank everybody for their participation and, and appreciate your attentiveness and all the information that's been shared. And um, we hope that you all have a, found this um, resourceful. I think one of the speakers or presenters said that if you can take away one thing, um, this was a successful uh, event. And I would confidently say that everybody was able to take away at least one thing, um, probably multiple things. Uh, so this has this has been a very successful event, um, an inaugural tool, if that's a word, um, event. Uh, but but it was very 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 informative, and um, and I truly thank everyone for their participation. Like Kareem said, we thank y'all so much. Thank you so much to the Ewe Foundation team who have been here the entire time and to our guests who have stayed with us the entire time. We understand folks had to be in and out, but we appreciate the time that you did give us. Um, and until the next video, keep being rare. Thank y'all so much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.